Hello and welcome to Pick 6 Movies, the podcast where every season we select six movies all related to a theme, and then on each episode we explore the history behind how each movie was made. Then on top of that, we give you a full review of the movie from start to finish. This is season 18, and if the music didn't give it away, this season's theme is all about the holidays, and it's titled Christmas Time is Here. Well, it's sort of here. See, all the movies this season take place in and around Christmas. They're kind of Christmas adjacent, if you will. I'm Chad Cooper, and along with one of the holliest and jolliest of people I know, my lifelong friend, Mr. Bo Ransdell, we're serving up movies that are technically Christmas-ish films, but not exactly what you would call festive film fare. Case in point, the subject of this episode, Batman Returns, a movie that most people don't remember, let alone that it took place at Christmas a time of year that the movie's famous filmmaker, Tim Burton, has introduced in multiple movies he's made. This is the second Batman movie directed by Tim Burton, and it features not only the Batman, but the Catwoman and the Penguin, and there's a Christopher Walken in a Winter Wonderland. Batman kills people as holiday shoppers rush home with their presents. There's enough graphic sex talk to make most parents question taking their kids to see this in theaters, and an elf man shows up to reheat his iconic Batman soundtrack to make the movie all the more enjoyable. Speaking of making things all the more enjoyable, let's get Bo in here to tell us how one of the most creative filmmakers of the last 30 years came to direct the first big screen adaptation of Batman and its inevitable sequel, Batman Returns. If you're a movie nerd like me, you hear the word auteur bandied about like so much yarn by a Catwoman. But what makes a director an auteur? At the risk of being cliché, Webster's defines auteur as an artist whose style and practice are distinctive. So you're telling me an auteur is an auteur just because they have a style that makes a piece of art distinctly their own. Well, that seems way less fancy than the word suggests, but then again, how many actual auteurs are left? Martin Scorsese, perhaps, whose use of rapid cuts, bold lighting, and needle drops gives his films a unique style all his own. Wes Anderson, for sure, who seems to make movies that exist in some soft and nostalgic world not quite our own, but entirely familiar. Steven Spielberg at one time, though his later work has less of the soft focus magic of those original Amblin classics. Quentin Tarantino is one of the last great auteurs, employing very specific dialogue and an eye for emulating the styles of other masters in a way that feels very much his own. The Coen brothers certainly have a vibe that is unmatched by other creators, but it's a dying breed. In a world where indie directors of note are snatched up by the big studios to helm the latest blockbuster, there is little room left in the multiplex for a movie that's perhaps off the beaten path. Robert Eggers, who delivered an astounding one-two punch with The Witch and The Lighthouse, is a modern auteur, but his work is more obscure than a Scorsese or a Tarantino. It's hard in this cynical age of cinematic profiteering for an artist to be an artist. But you know who became a blockbuster machine, even though he didn't mean to? That's right, the director of tonight's movie, a movie that could not, I would argue, be directed by anyone but the man behind the camera, Tim Burton. We've been in Burton land before with 2001's Planet of the Apes, see season 8 episode 2 for that, one of the least Burton-esque of his movies I would argue, but let's dig into this guy with a bit more of a discerning eye and see what makes Burton an auteur, at least for much of his career. Burton was born in Burbank, California in 1958. His father was a minor league baseball player who ended up working for the local Parks and Recreation Department when dreams of a big league career never materialized. His mother ran a cat-themed gift shop, probably called Whiskers and Bits or That Place That Smells, one of those. Tim was a shy kid from way back, an introvert who loved books and movies more than the school dances. In fact, Tim didn't do all that well in school, despite his natural curiosity. He was a smart kid using a Super 8 camera to make stop-motion films when he was just 13 years old. 
When he wasn't making movies, he painted and he watched those movies. As a child, he was enamored with the work of Dr. Seuss and Roald Dahl, influences that would follow him all through his career and ultimately lead to a terrible version of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. That is best avoided at all costs. He found refuge as a child in the cemetery at the end of his street. It didn't quite feel morbid, he would recall. It felt more exciting and lonely and special and emotional. Unsurprisingly, the characters from horror movies like Frankenstein not only appealed to young Burton, he identified with their role as misunderstood outcasts. Even those who Burton counted as friends were inclined to remind Burton that he was not normal, at least not in the way most high school kids are. He was more obsessed with the gothic hammer horror films than with participating in sports. Unlike many of his peers, Burton could talk with passion about German expressionists and their use of shadow rather than what might be happening around the school. One teacher Burton recalled nurturing him, allowing him to be weird in a world that pressured the young man to conform. Doris Adams said of her student later, quote, He was very quiet, but he drew the most wonderful, fanciful figures you could ever imagine. Instead of getting in trouble, he would just take his pen and be lost in his drawings. And after high school, Tim Burton attended the California Institute of the Arts, where he dove into more character design and animation, and made the shorts King and Octopus and Stalk of the Celery Monster. It was the latter that drew the interest of Walt Disney Studios' animation division, and Burton was offered an apprenticeship with Walt Disney Studios. He worked on The Fox and the Hound and The Black Cauldron and Tron, all as storyboard or graphic artists, but his work was never really seen on screen. While at Disney, Burton found a friend in Rick Heinrichs, who also worked at Disney and had done effects for The Watcher in the Woods, among other films. Heinrichs produced Burton's next short called Vincent, all about a boy who imagines he is the legendary horror actor Vincent Price. Price himself lent his melodious voice to the short, which would establish a working relationship with Tim Burton that would last until Price's death. You may recall him from the beginning of Edward Scissorhands, which of course, and sadly, was Vincent Price's last on-screen role. Burton did another short for Disney called Hansel and Gretel that employed an anime style in the retelling of the fairy tale that culminated in a kung fu fight. That short was ultimately shelved and is extraordinarily hard to come by. The following short was better received. Called Frankenweenie, this story of a boy who revived his dog after a car accident harkened back to Burton's stop-motion days of his youth and garnered voice talent from the likes of Shelley Duvall and Daniel Stern. Now, while a lot of people liked Frankenweenie, Disney took one look at the final product and promptly fired Tim Burton on the grounds that he had wasted studio time and money on a short that was way too dark and twisted for their intended audience. Spoil sports. While Disney might not have thought much of Burton at the time, another performer on the rise saw Frank and Weenie and thought Tim Burton was just the guy to direct him in his new effort. Pee Wee Herman, aka Paul Rubens, was on the rise. Paul Rubens' signature character was riding high on a theater show, which was later adapted into an HBO comedy special that was an equally big, if subversive, hit. It was time for Pee Wee Herman to make the transition from the small screen to the big screen, and creator Paul Rubens wanted that translation into cinemas to be something special. In Burton's work, he saw a kindred spirit, and Paul Rubens lobbied for Burton to sit in the director's chair. Given the modest budget of Pee-wee's Big Adventure, it really wasn't that big of a gamble on the first-time feature director. But when Pee-wee's Big Adventure was released, it was a giant and surprise hit. Fueled by Rubens' terrific lead performance, the movie was buoyed by Burton's off-kilter art style and his pick of Boingo Boingo musician Danny Elfman to furnish the score. The movie was a true original, and a big enough success that Tim Burton was given the green light for his next movie, Beetlejuice. This is the story of a ghost couple trying to rid their haunted home of some unpleasant living residents. Michael Keaton stepped into the title role as the human exorcist, and with a blend of humor, inventive afterlife mythology, and an outstanding Danny Elfman score, Beetlejuice felt like an even greater realization of Tim Burton's unique aesthetic. 
and like Pee-wee's Big Adventure, it was a big hit. Studio executives at Warner Brothers were impressed by Tim Burton's ability to make a lot of money off of modestly priced films, and they were in the market to make an adaptation of Batman. Now, this would be Tim Burton's biggest budget yet, which meant way more studio involvement. John Peters and Peter Gruber were producing the movie and were obviously interested in making the most consumer-friendly product they could to get as many asses in the seats as possible. There hadn't been a big-screen Batman since Adam West, and those terrible Superman sequels had pretty much killed the superhero genre. But this was going to be decidedly less campy trading on the wave of comic book obsession gripping the country. As we've discussed previously on Pick 6 Movies, comics came of age in the 80s and 90s, and mature work was being done across the medium. Borrowing heavily from the look and feel of Alan Moore's The Killing Joke graphic novel, Burton wanted to emphasize the gothic look and feel of Gotham City, and to offer up a Bruce Wayne who really was just a normal rich guy until he donned the suit. While Michael Keaton wasn't his first pick, we'll get to that later, Tim Burton loved Michael Keaton in the role after dismissing the likes of Mel Gibson, Pierce Brosnan, and Bill Murray for this part. Warner Brothers got over 50,000 letters from fans saying that Michael Keaton was hashtag not my Batman. In response, Warner Brothers was quick to release a teaser trailer showing Keaton acting decidedly non-comedic after roles in Mr. Mom and Gung Ho, and also showcased Jack Nicholson's Joker performance. That seemed to keep the nerds at bay long enough to build the hype for this movie, which continued to grow amidst the biggest marketing blitz in the history of modern cinema. And thus, Tim Burton's Batman was unleashed unto the world. It was one of those you-had-to-be-there cultural moments. Not only was it the biggest movie of that summer, it made superhero movies viable, something that hadn't been true for almost a decade, and it cemented Tim Burton as a filmmaking phenomena. And how did he follow up this mega-hit? Why, with a deeply personal film with Johnny Depp called Edward Scissorhands. The suburbia of Burton's childhood was filtered through his artistic prism, and became a fable of isolation, loneliness, and the redemptive power of art. We'll dig into the follow-up to that, Batman Returns, in just a moment, but let's continue to follow this thread of filmmaking during the height of Burton's powers. After Batman Returns, which was not quite the hit the 1989 Batman had been, Burton told the tale of another outsider, the B-movie filmmaker Ed Wood. Johnny Depp returned to Burton Land to play the eternally optimistic director, and Martin Landau nabbed an Oscar for his portrayal of Bela Lugosi. Ed Wood is an astounding, funny, and moving film about the magic of movies and the possibilities they represent. After that came Mars Attacks, and then Sleepy Hollow, movies that could not be mistaken for anything other than Tim Burton films, with their trademark styles despite being very different kinds of movies. Then the aforementioned Planet of the Apes, and on the heels of that big fish, with Ewan McGregor and Albert Finney about family bonds and the magical power of a good story. Huh, it's almost like there are recurring themes of art as salvation in his movies? It's weird. After that came twin disappointments with Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and The Corpse Bride, the latter of which led Burton back to his stop-motion roots, but disappointed when compared to movies he'd produced, like The Nightmare Before Christmas and James and the Giant Peach, both of which left the directing up to the marvelous Henry Selleck. Then came Sweeney Todd, which I would argue is the last of the great Burton films, with a vicious sense of humor and a terrific art style that reminded viewers of the best of Burton's gothic work. Then the big-budget stinker Alice in Wonderland, which made lots of money but left audiences and critics in the doldrums, while his more modest adaptation of Dark Shadows was just plain bad. He remade his own Frankenweenie into a feature film, and then returned to the writers of Ed Wood for another mostly true tale of art fraud called Big Eyes, which was better received than most recent efforts. And then came Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children, a very Burton-esque tale of a school for oddly talented youngsters, and then Dumbo, another Disney adaptation that felt more mechanical than inspired, now in his mid-60s, it's not unusual for a visionary director to have lost a step or two, but now and again he manages to create something only Tim Burton could make. 
Perhaps his upcoming imagining of the Adams Family character, Wednesday, a limited series on Netflix, will remind us why we all got so excited about Tim Burton in the first place. And there are rumors of a Beetlejuice sequel that sounds less promising, but only time will tell. And so let's circle back to the subject of this episode. The much-anticipated follow-up to Tim Burton's 1989 blockbuster, Batman. At first, Tim Burton wanted nothing to do with a sequel to his interpretation of Batman, stating only a truly interesting idea could woo him back into the director's chair. As happens with these types of films, a sequel was in development about the same time the opening weekend's box office returns were known, and a script was started by Sam Hamm, who penned the original Batman 1989 script. Bob Kane, one of the creators of Batman alongside Bill Finger, was listed as a consultant as Ham worked out a tale of Catwoman and Penguin on the search for treasure in Gotham City. Warner Brothers didn't want to ruin a good thing by risking a new director who could potentially screw up the Batman cash cow, so they made a deal for Tim Burton to return that embodies the dream of every director. Burton would have complete creative control over the film, from casting to script to editing. And it turned out that was enough to get Tim Burton back. Only he wasn't knocked out by Sam Hamm's script, so he brought in Daniel Waters, who had recently scored big with the black comedy Heathers. Waters went to work repurposing the original script, inserting a new character named Max Schreck, an obvious tip of the hat to F.W. Murnau's Nosferatu, a German expressionist classic of the silent film era. Schreck would be an ardent capitalist, and Water script was as much social satire as superhero movie. Quote, I wanted to show that the true villains of our world don't necessarily wear costumes, he said, and the additional flair of the Penguin running for mayor was a direct reference to a pair of episodes of the Batman series from the 1960s where the exact same thing had happened. Wesley Strick, writer of the Cape Fear remake and Arachnophobia, among others, also did an uncredited pass on the script, further defining Penguin's overall plot and background and inserting the rather biblical final stroke of having Penguin attempt to murder the first sons of Gotham. There was also a subplot involving Batman sidekick Robin, but that was excised on account of Daniel Waters not caring for Robin much as a character and feeling that the film had enough happening without a plucky pal. Michael Keaton was on board for reprising the role of Bruce Wayne in his superhero alter ego, Danny DeVito was plucked for the Penguin, and Catwoman was naturally going to be played by Annette Bening. Yep, hot on the heels of her turn in The Grifters, Annette Bening was Burton's first pick for the villainous feline. But Annette Bening got pregnant, which would have stretched the latex catsuit to shocking proportions, so a hunt was underway for a replacement. Very famously, actress Sean Young from Blade Runner and Ace Ventura showed up at a production office with Tim Burton and a talk show in her homemade Catwoman outfit campaigning for the part against the likes of Jennifer Jason Lee and Bridget Fonda and Susan Sarandon and Cher, among many others. Burton didn't know much about Michelle Pfeiffer, but she sure knew about Catwoman. Michelle Pfeiffer was obsessed with the character for years before a Batman film existed, and when the role came up after Annette Bening was forced to leave, she agreed to do it before she ever finished the script. When Tim Burton met her, he agreed after that first meeting that Pfeiffer was perfect for the part, and the new Catwoman underwent months of training in kickboxing and the use of the whip. And then there was the suit. The Catwoman suit was a thin latex, which kept Michelle Pfeiffer chilled along with the actual penguins used in the movie, and then it was vacuum sealed to her body. The mask would occasionally choke her, and early versions had no way for her to, you know, do bathroom business. Danny DeVito's penguin outfit was equally hard to apply, with the actor in a makeup chair for about four and a half hours for some of the shoot, which was then streamlined to about three hours in a chair for every day of shooting. The trademark black drool was all DeVito's idea, which Burton of course signed off on, but DeVito had his spin on the character and went method with it talking in his penguin voice even when the cameras weren't rolling. Co-star Christopher Walken said, I saw Danny after the movie, never during production. Speaking of our old pal Christopher Walken, he was Burton's first pick for Batman in the early days of 89's Batman casting. When a sequel came around, Tim Burton was determined to get the actor in the plum role of Max Schreck, 
and Walken chewed the scenery while Keaton lobbied to have more and more of his dialogue cut out of the film, feeling that the suit did most of the talking for him, which left Batman mostly silent for much of this movie. Shooting was done on sound stages in enough cold to keep the penguins happy and everyone else pretty miserable to one degree or another, except for Danny DeVito who was under layers of coats and latex in his penguin outfit. The secrecy surrounding the film was incredibly intense and Warner Brothers spent $15 million of the $80 million budget of this movie to hype it with marketing. Knowing the power of this strategy from the first movie, Warner Brothers went hard with Batman Returns. Though the movie Burton was making had retailers confused and maybe a little worried. Companies like McDonald's wondered what the hell was happening with a villain leaking goo out of his mouth and the fetishistic Catwoman outfit was built more for adults than the sides of Happy Meal boxes. But that was the whole thing. Burton had total freedom and wanted to do a wild take on the Batman mythos, indulging in his own delights. He had Michelle Pfeiffer swallowing a real bird and Batman blowing up a clown with dynamite, seemingly with little reason or remorse. It was, writer Daniel Waters later said, a Batman movie for people who didn't like Batman movies. When the film released, it was a giant hit, of course, but it didn't meet the success of the original. It was too dark, too kinky, too weird for it to be a mainstream hit in the way that the more simplistic Batman 89 was. Batman Returns even lost the Happy Meal boxes after parent groups protested the film's fetishy visuals and deeply dark undertones. But Burton remained proud of the work he did despite one change after the fact. That final shot of Catwoman and the Bat Signal added less than two weeks before the film's opening when groups from test screenings responded that they wanted more of the Catwoman and Warner Brothers wasn't looking to make a movie, they were looking to start a franchise. And if Catwoman was popular, bada bing bada boom, she's alive at the end. But a few additions couldn't shake the vibe of the movie. It's unabashedly sexual, filled with murky psychology and over-the-top performances. It's a reflection of Burton himself, a comic book movie made by a real auteur. Ah, there's that word again. Batman Returns is a Batman movie only Burton could have made, for better or worse. And the studios landed on the or worse side of that argument. When talk of a third Batman film began, Tim Burton pitched ideas and geared up for another go-round, re-energized by his experience in making Batman Returns, but the suits at Warner Brothers were looking for a movie that could sell some toys, not explore the psychosexual relationships of split personalities who were wearing literal masks to hide their insecurities and fears. It was quickly clear in his meetings that the studio wanted someone other than Tim Burton to take over the franchise, and the less grim Joel Schumacher was tapped to lead the franchise in its campier, more kid-friendly direction, while Tim Burton was relegated to producer in name only. Keaton found the idea of doing these more audience-pleasing takes on the characters less interesting, so he bailed on the franchise too, paving the way for a series of Batman to follow. And for all the backlash, critics found some life in the movie. Variety's Todd McCarthy said, quote, The result is a seamless, utterly consistent universe full of nasty notions about societal deterioration, greed, and other base impulses. The movie's main writer, Daniel Waters, said of the movie in retrospect, quote, What I like most about Batman Returns is what probably really rubs people the wrong way. It's a movie about messy, sexually warped adults who like to dress up not as immaculate icons. But what do we here at Pick 6 Movies make of this wintry walk down sexually warped lane? Well, let's get Chad in here and dive deep into this Bat's Cave for a look at this bizarre entry in the superhero medium. Ladies and gentlemen, penguins and catwomen, it's 1992's Batman Returns. And welcome, everyone, to yet another episode of Pick 6 Movies. My name is Bo, and I am joined, uh, as usual, by the Catwoman to my penguin. Meow. Mm, <laughs> whack, whack, whack. Is that how penguins sound? 
<laughs> in this, they just ooze black shit out of their mouth and sound like this. We are, of course, here in the uh, season 18, which we are calling Christmas Time is here, and nothing says Christmas like sexed up Michelle Pfeiffer and a horny, <laughs> deformed Danny DeVito. And I don't think that I'm the first person or the last person to say that. Definitely not. So, Chad, we once again find ourselves playing our dangerous game with superhero movies, which we can't seem to get away from. This is our third movie featuring Batman. It's our second movie with a Catwoman. It's also our second movie with a Michael Keaton and our second movie with a Christopher Walken. Yeah, boy, that that was a nice surprise. I'd forgotten how, <laughs> just how much Christopher Walken was in this movie. Yeah. And that was wonderful. Let me ask you this. When you make a superhero movie sequel, is the lazy path forward just to slap the name Returns on the ass end of the superhero's name? Because you had Batman, and then there was Batman Returns, and then there was Superman, and then Superman Returns, and Nanny McPhee, and Nanny McPhee Returns, and then there was Mary Poppins, and Mary Poppins Returns, there was Max Dugan, and Max Dugan Returns. <laughs> and then Cocoon and Cocoon Returns. It really seems like there's a pattern here. It's basically saying, you know, like, hey, you remember that thing? Uh, the, the, more of that. It's a little bit more the of that gambler thing. returned with Kenny Rogers. That's true. I don't know that I had kind of couched Nanny McPhee and Mary Poppins as superheroes in my, in my mind. What are you talking about? They got magical powers? Mary Poppins flies around? Yeah, no, I'm not disagreeing with you. <laughs> I'm just saying I hadn't thought about it in that way until now. And it's really recontextualized a lot of those movies for me. There was an animated sequel to Frosty the Snowman called Frosty Returns. Yeah. Featuring the voice talents of Jonathan Winters, Jan Hooks, Andrea martin brian doyle murray elizabeth moss and john goodman as frosty the snowman because he used to be fat yeah well isn't he still i mean he's less fat but i don't know that he's svelte he drained all that weight out of him he kind of looks like you know how al roker did yeah where he just looks kind of deflated yeah Am I the only one who thinks that Kevin Smith now looks like a white version of Al Sharpton? Maybe. Again, I, it's not a comparison <laughs> I've thought of before, but I don't think you're wrong about that. What are we talking about? Uh, oh, yeah. ba Batman, Batman Returns. Yeah, there's a Batman <laughs> in the movie. Yeah, so... Like, wh where do you come down on the 89 Batman? Are you, are you a supporter of that film? First off, though. Yes. I think that the world needs a new Batman movie put out every single year just so that people on the internet can have something to be opinionated about. I don't truck with the internet that much. <laughs> Do people get upset about these movies on the internet? That seems stupid. Anything related to anything is what people get upset about on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> that seems, seems to, to throw a wide blanket across of th things, but go yeah. on. Yes. When it comes to the original Batman movie, I went back and watched it, and it's fine. I don't think it's great. The biggest issue I have with the original Batman and this movie is that they are made by Tim Burton. Now, as your introduction brilliantly explored, he has an incredible talent visually, but as a storyteller, he's just awful. I do don't like Tim Burton movies because the coherence of the narrative is just Swiss cheese. I've said this before, I think, on this podcast. The movies of his that I really enjoy are Pee-wee's Big Adventure. I think Ed Wood is a masterpiece. And I can watch Big Fish because it's a movie where a coherent narrative doesn't matter. Every other movie that he makes, there's just moments, and, and we'll talk about it in this film, where it's just like, what is going on here? It, it, they just gloss over that because it's like, doesn't everything just look so stylistic? And if you like that, then great. So going back to the original Batman, yeah, it's you know it's kind of interesting and doing what I'm saying, but there's some weird plot holes in it that I'm like, I, I just confuse me. Yeah, I like everything in these movies, I think, until Batman shows up. I think that's my problem with both Batman and Batman Returns, is that I do not care about the superhero stuff, but I like just about everything else about it. And the fact that in Batman Returns, there isn't that much Batman is kind of a plus for me, even though Batman shows up in this movie like it's a studio note, you know, like it's like, hey, the kids are coming for the Batman. You got to show them the Batman. It's like, all right, all right, all right. How about uh, he shows up and beats up some clowns? Perfect. Maybe they should have put a question mark in the title, like Batman Returns. Hmm? 
or just added to it so it's Batman Returns for a minute, you know, like he, <laughs> like he forgot his coat or something. <laughs> so let's kick this thing off. Our movie starts and we are outside the Cobblepot Mansion and it feels very Charles Foster Kane-ish. And then we make our way inside the mansion where we find Mr. Cobblepot as played by Paul Rubens, a.k.a. Pee Wee Herman. And he's dressed up like a snooty French maitre d' and he's smoking a cigarette out of a holder and he's got this fake salt and pepper hair suitable for a high school stage production of On Golden Pond. Was this before or after The Troubles? Uh, 92... I feel like that's after. After. Yeah, so I feel like this is sort of Tim Burton being like, no, 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 you can still be in movies, even if it's for just a minute and you can't say (laughs) nothing, but (laughs) but you're still allowed in Hollywood. We hear a baby crying, and a nurse comes running out of a room with these tall, angled doors, and she's just like vomiting in her hand, and then out comes a doctor who works part-time as an Ed Asner impersonator, and then Mr. Cobblepot, a.k.a. the Penguin's dad, a.k.a. Old Man Pee Wee Herman, he runs into the room, and he screams out loud because Francis has stolen his bike again in the forthcoming sequel, Pee Wee's Big Adventure Returns. Francis. Diane Salinger plays Mrs. Cobblepot, a.k.a. the Penguin's mom, a.k.a. Simone the Waitress from Pee-wee's Big Adventure. Oh, very nice. Yeah, it's a real reunion. Simone, why don't you tell me about your big butt? I like the mirror of the scene of him drinking the martini as he's waiting for his child to be born. And then cut to after the horrifying child is born when you get Mm -hmm. the next shot of both of them together they're both drinking martinis in the same pose by the window yeah that's a nice little touch but so they've got this new baby of theirs in what can only be described as a baby's first cage it's not even a cage it looks like that thing the crate that that monster was in in creep show it's like this bolted together box with metal bars on it and it also by the way it's christmas time the camera pans over and we see a christmas mystery yeah which is why it finds its way into this season uh it's almost <laughs> like they were like eventually someday some movie podcast and i don't, i know you don't know what a podcast is yet but they're gonna make those and when they do there's gonna be uh the best one and it's gonna be all about movies <laughs> and they're gonna have a theme one year and it's gonna be christmas adjacent movies and this is kind of a christmas movie in name only So this is going to be perfect for it. So every now and again, somebody like light a tree or something so that we can be in that podcast. (laughs) We see these little flipper hands poking out of the bars in the hole of this box. And there's a cat standing nearby being an asshole the way cats do. And on top of this box, there's a stick with a string and attached at the end of the string is a yellow rubber ducky. I'm assuming for this deformed child to play with. (laughs) And as mom and pops slug back these martinis, a little flipper hand reaches out and grabs the cat, snatches it inside the box, and we get a good old fashioned. And I guess now he's going to play with the cat. Oh, no, Chad. He just eats this cat, (laughs) which again, I appreciate it. It it reminded me a bit of the movie uh, It's Alive (laughs) uh, about that mutant baby and, you know. That's never going to do me wrong. We cut to mom and dad pushing a wicker stroller in the snow at night across a bridge where they pass Jack Skellington and Edward Scissorhands (laughs) and Charlie Bucket's grandparents. And (laughs) also, this is like them looking as sketchy as possible all over their faces is we're about to throw this baby in a river yeah which is what they do they go up to the top of a bridge and they chunk the wicker basket into the icy waters below you know who loved this movie bo me susan Smith. (laughs) yeah well i mean that's how i've dealt with every child that i've you know (laughs) quote had and then we get tim burton's name he gets top billing in the movie well i mean it's his movie I guess, but come on, man. You put your name at the end and directed by. We know you did this. Look, there is absolutely no question. Like you said, you start off in Nightmare Before Christmas Land (laughs) and end up in like Tim Burton's wet dream. Well, then it's followed by Michael Keaton, Danny DeVito, Michelle Pfeiffer, then Christopher Walken. And finally, it says Batman Returns. 
Question mark. <laughs> As we get the music from Scrooged, which I, I, I really like, Danny Elfman, <laughs> and just like, hey, remember that music uh, where all the, the choir is, is chanting all creepy like? And it la, sounds. Yeah. It's that. that. That is the, the score for the front end of this movie, which, I mean, again, no complaints here. And they waste about two or three minutes of your life with a bunch of unnecessary wicker basket floating mm -hmm. with the opening credits. And finally, this little basket stops and it bumps into an ice flow or a ledge or a service truck ramp. I don't know what it is. And I was thinking, are we in the city sewers? Because when this thing stops, there's a group of penguins hanging out. And I'm like, so they're going to raise this baby? Does Gotham have a penguins in the sewer problem i've heard of alligators in the sewers yeah but penguins that's a new one bro. Uh, well a little girl got uh, a baby penguin at a penguin farm <laughs> and flushed it her father flushed it down the toilet while she was at school <laughs> and bada bing bada boom you got a, a sewer full of penguins but yeah i the other explanation and this is the legit explanation for this by the way uh-huh is that they had the gotham zoo and they had like you know this arctic world place that we'll we'll see a model of in a minute right but they had a penguin exhibit there and when it came time to shut the zoo down they were just like uh how about we put them penguins in the sewers <laughs> and they were like oh yeah i guess but wait <laughs> so arctic world is connected to the sewers well i mean of course it is all right so at this point when they chunk the baby in the water the zoo is shut down right it's gone defunct right yes Okay, because we now get a title card that says, Gotham City, 33 years later. Mm -hmm. So over three decades, they never put any money back into the Gotham Zoo? No, no, no. Like, it, <laughs> look, there was a big downturn in real estate, especially after the Joker showed up and murdered a bunch of people. You can buy real estate in Gotham for a song. I guess so. <laughs> because there's about a 12% chance at any point that you're going to be the victim of supervillainy. All right. So we've flashed forward 33 years now and it's winter and it is also Christmas time again. And there's a newspaper barking out extra, extra grotesque penguin man sighting. Read all about it. Disgusting fat man with flipper hands who's coming to get your children. Hide your wives. Hide your kids. Grab your copy of the latest edition of the Gotham Herald. Yeah. And Alfred, our faithful butler, Alfred, is out buying Christmas presents. Uh huh. And that newsy is like, how about you, old man? You want to read a newspaper about crazy mutants in the sewers? And he's like, you know, I find that most of the trash that you're peddling is occasionally a diversion, but most of the time, it's a waste of time. So, I'll take that as a no. Extra, extra, who wants to read Trash and Diversions? The camera pans over, Bo, and we see the most embarrassingly attended Christmas tree lighting ceremony that I've ever had the misfortune to witness. This tree stands all stately and high in the air, but the number of people watching this is equal to a potential suicide jumper. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like 20 people. Right, but look, if you were a resident of Gotham City... And we're like, hey, we're going to get a bunch of people together in one place. I would be like, fuck no, I'm not going to that. That's the perfect place for a supervillain <laughs> to strike. Were, were you not watching all the Joker stuff that happened two years ago? When they had the parade? You idiot! Right, it's like COVID now. Like, if you were like, hey, do you want to go to a Christmas tree light? I'd be like, no! That sounds like a vector for disease. <laughs> this ice princess, who's this blonde-haired beauty queen, she comes out, and the mayor's there, and she drops her coat to reveal this silver and black Santa baby outfit. She hits the plunger, the tree lights up, about eight or ten people clap. <laughs> And then we hear, we wish you a Merry Christmas. And then we cut to see two flipper hands grabbing the bars that lead to the sewers. Yeah. Look, I just want to see what they're doing. Alfred walks over and he steps over the sewer grate and the hands disappear. And then Alfred turns and looks back with this air of, of something is up. Because Alfred's the closest thing we have to a detective in this movie. It's certainly not Batman. No. Despite the fact that the character originated from Detective Comics, the Batman in this movie is not what you would call a master detective. <clears throat> no. It, it uh -huh. takes a villain telling him in this movie, by the way, I'm a villain, for him to be like, wait a second, are you a villain? It's pretty good. <laughs> but then let's go to really the star of the movie, Chad. We head inside 
this store called Shrek's. Donkey! Say something that almost sounds racist by today's social standards. Ugh. <laughs> I thought Shrex was a toy store at first. It's like a Macy's. It's kind of everything. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I guess. We head to the penthouse and we see this giant rotating mascot head for this department store. It looks like Jack from Jack in the Box had a baby with Sonic the Hedgehog. Yeah, with a dash of Fritz the Cat, it's really unsettling. <laughs> We head inside the penthouse boardroom where we meet the real star of our movie, Max Shrek, as played by Christopher Walken. And I'm just calling him Christopher Walken for the rest of this conversation. Sure. Max Shrek is a great name for the character. Again, it's it's a nod to one of the great silent films and, and Max Shrek is a terrific actor, blah, blah, blah. But Christopher Walken is totally Christopher Walkening it up in this movie. Yeah. Which I love. In this movie, he kind of looks like that scientist that created the robot chicken. He's got this wild mane of silver hair. He looks like what I imagine Doc Brown looked like in the early 40s. It's very Doc Brown. <laughs> Great Scott invented a car that travels back in time. It's wonderful. <laughs> he is, And he is the villain of this movie up until penguin shows up essentially i disagree i think he's the villain in the whole movie well until yes. he disappears and then kind of shows up anyway we'll get to it they're having a meeting where the mayor and a bunch of flunkies are sitting around a table discussing yeah. the gotham power problem and the thing is that christopher walken wants to build this giant new power plant i almost feel vulgar in this yuletide context to talk about building a power plant but what are you gonna do stop me i don't think so he has this great line and again this is just pure christopher walken it's like this is the undiluted christopher walken that you get direct from the distributor like it hasn't uh -huh. been stomped on yet or anything mm -hmm. or there's no baby laxative in this christopher walken it's just the mm -mm. good shit like if you shot up with it it would just kill you right away i think his direction was just bigger more of that whatever it is that you do do that <laughs> times three the, the, like the whole deal is he wants to build this power plant and the mayor's like we've got a power surplus building a power plant sounds like the stupidest thing ever and he's like mr mayor i look out the window i see all these christmas lights flickering not enough power <laughs> frankly i cringe mr maya <laughs> and you're like oh oh give me more of all of this you say we don't need a power plant what what are you egghead scientists know gotham's growing baby it's on the move last year <laughs> gotham grew one percent it's not growth that's just swelling everything he does in this movie is the best all this time selena kyle aka catwoman as played by Michelle Pfeiffer. She's hunched over, walking around, filling up coffee cups of all the male power players in this room. Michelle Pfeiffer is a lot of fun in this movie. Hell, most yeah. of the actors and actresses in this movie are having fun because it is a comic book movie about a man dressed up like a bat doing battle with a weird little flipper hand guy and a woman in a leather S&M outfit cracking a whip to get people's attention. I mean, all of that sounds good on paper. The people that they cast in this movie are really good performers. Just they give it a hundred percent. There's just some flaws that I'll I'll touch on later. Yeah. The mayor looks at Christopher Walken and says, "Look, Christopher Walken, if you want permits to build this power plant that we don't need, you're gonna have to go through the usual channels." And Selena Kyle, aka Catwoman, she chimes in, "Uh, I've got a question uh, or a suggestion, something." And all of the heads in this room swivel in her direction, which, let's be honest, Bo, it's a little unorthodox that none of the men in this boardroom aren't grabbing her ass or making kissy noises or encouraging her to twirl around to see what's under that skirt. Christopher Walken gives it his best because he says, yeah. sorry, we haven't properly housebroken Mrs. Kyle. She makes a hell of a cup of coffee. Well, someone had to break the misogynistic ice in the room and... Who better to do that than Christopher Walken? Dude, this is secretly one of my favorite characters in this movie. In uh -huh. walks Christopher Walken's shitty kid Chip, who is low-key <laughs> doing a Christopher Walken impression in this movie, which I really <laughs> love. And he's like, hey, Dad, I'm here to be with you here on this holiday. And he's like, look, everyone, it's Chip. It's my kid. Let's, let's break up this meeting. It's time to bring joy to the masses. And so 
all of these dudes head out for the Christmas tree lighting or whatever the fuck, leaving behind Michelle Pfeiffer, who is giving herself a real stupid, stupid. Why did you say suggestion instead of question? Oh, stupid. You're just the worst. She calls herself, you're, you're a stupid corn dog. That- <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty good <laughs> down on the streets the mayor and christopher walken and chip and toe they're all mobbed by this mass of 15 to 16 people still lingering around the christmas tree and then down in the sewer we see the shadow of a fat little man with an umbrella or maybe it's a parasol it depends on the time of day and the weather conditions christopher walken and the mayor they walk through the crowd where they reenact a conversation between rudy giuliani and john eastman and walken says look I've got enough employees at my company to demand a recall. That's not a threat. It's just simple numbers. Yeah, and the mayor, (laughs) played by Michael McDonald, is like, you might have the numbers, but you don't have a candidate, and you don't have an issue to force a recall. So Ah, up your butt with the details. The mayor takes the stage to give his big Christmas address, right? Merry Christmas. Here's Christopher Walken. Yeah, and Christopher Walken. Dude, he starts tossing out packages like he's Trump distributing paper towels to hurricane victims it's great and so he climbs behind this podium and he's about to give a speech and he reaches into his pocket and uh-huh. realizes the speech is not there just as upstairs michelle pfeiffer is going through this checklist of like did i remember everything let's see i got the coffee made and then I wore something that could degrade me and then i said something stupid then i cleaned up the coffee yeah. And then she's like, oh my God, the speech. While all of this is going on, it's happening in front of a wall that has all of these Photoshop pictures of Christopher Walken with celebrities. Among them are included Christopher Walken with Sammy Davis Jr., Arnold Schwarzenegger, and Elvis. I couldn't identify the other ones, but I'm sure that there's some real humdingers in there. Yeah, I think one is like Che Guevara. Adolf Hitler, based on some of his comments later in the movie. Yeah, some you know gerbils yeah and so christopher walken is now forced to improvise and the way he does so the mayor has introduced him as like gotham's own santa claus so Mm -hmm. what he says again turning the christopher walken to 13 in this movie he goes santa claus afraid not i'm just a poor schmo who got lucky i only wish i could hand out more than expensive baubles i wish (laughs) i could hand out world peace in a big bow He does tell his son, Chip, when I get back upstairs, remind me to take out the fact that I forgot my speech on that no-name secretary. Sure, Dad. (laughs) Then we get a cutaway to the penguin in the sewers, and he goes, Oh, but you can. Oh, but Mm, you will. This is going to be good. Then this giant presence starts wheeling out from one of the alleyways, Mm -hmm. and the mayor's like, That's a pretty good trick, Christopher Walken. He's like, That one's not mine. I've said that to a number of women over the years, not mine. Then this package explodes with a bunch of clowns and guys on motorcycles with big bobble skull masks on. Mm -hmm. They're fire breathers, stilt walkers. Mr. Vargas from Fast Times at Ridgemont High shows up with a monkey and an organ grinder. Well, it's a Gatling gun posing as uh, an organ grinder. It's total chaos, Bo. A big muscle man picks up a sled and beats a street Santa with it. Yeah, it's pretty good. Selena Kyle comes running downstairs and uh, sees all the chaos. She gets scared and she tosses the speech into the air, which who cares at this point? Cops show up finally. And in the patrol car is Commissioner Gordon as played by Pat Hingle. Welcome back to the show, Mr. Hingle. We haven't seen him since we left the Dixie Boy truck stop in Maximum Overdrive, Season 9, Episode 5 of this very podcast. Commissioner Gordon, not wanting to incur any lawsuits due to negligent police work and law enforcement, he says, what are you doing? Fire up the bats! signal (laughs) clearly we can't handle this level of police work let's get our resident superhero involved we cut to wayne manor where we see michael keaton brooding in his house all alone with the lights off and then the bat signal hits the clouds but then some sort of series of atmospheric reflection causes it to hit another mirror that bounces off a wall and makes its way into his house and blasts him in the face because i didn't think about it to watch in this movie it was like unless batman's outside looking up in the air using the bat signal does not seem an effective way to get his attention I mean, yeah. just call him on the phone what if he's taking his shit you know? <laughs> right 
can't interrupt the bat poop. It's a very stylized shot of him standing up with the bat signal lit up behind him. And it's a great shot for the stills, but also in the context of the movie, it's like, well, you would never be able to get any sleep because A, Commissioner Gordon is pretty quick to turn this thing on. Like, he doesn't even try to stop what's going on. <laughs> no! In Gotham like City. Show up, he's like, ah, get Batman. I'm not getting my hands dirty in this. My wife has dinner on the table. I'm going to go to that. Call Batman. <laughs> He'll deal with all this. <laughs> it's a real Chief Wiggum type of approach to maintaining <laughs> peace in this city. Yeah. Go work, Batman. <laughs> Mr. Vargas walks over to the mayor and christopher walken and, and vargas says we want the big guy the one who runs this city and i just switched to sanka so have a heart then the mayor starts to step forward and mr vargas is like not you him and points to christopher walken and sh his shitty kid chip stands <laughs> up for his dad and is like no you're not gonna hurt my dad dad run away which is what christopher walken does he just books it the guy who plays chip in this went on to play leatherface in those texas chainsaw massacre remakes he's a big guy he looks like carrie elways if he got stung by a bunch of bees he looks like <laughs> the guy who played flash gordon in that 80s flash gordon movie eh, a little bit yeah that's who i thought it was for a while then i was like oh wait no he's far too young for that but then the batmobile shows up dude it's just driving down the road yeah batman's on his way to our movie eventually i think we're a good like 15 20 minutes into this thing we got no batman hell we only had one shot of bruce wayne hanging out thinking about stuff when the batmobile cruises into town the batmobile because it just has every gadget in the world that you possibly need i mean it's the inspector gadget of cars or mm -hmm. the captain caveman depending on how you feel about things and sure. it like there are little poles that stick out from the sides to knock the clown's office still uh -huh. he kicks some dudes through a window there's a guy dressed up like the devil who breathes fire into a storefront and sets this stuffed bear on fire. And then we see a guy just running around in flames. And all this time, Bo, Christopher Walken is doing the opposite of hiding in plain sight. He's just standing around. I think the objective of these bad guys is to get Christopher Walken, and they're really terrible at their jobs. We do see a guy on a unicycle riding around firing a machine gun in the air, chasing a screaming woman with shopping bags. And I wondered if ISIS rode around on unicycles, Cycles while they shot off their machine guns would that have increased or decreased the perceived threat of, as the world saw it oh decreased 100 percent. you think so yeah yeah like you can't take someone on a unicycle seriously it's why if your child tells you that they want to become a professional unicyclist you just uh -huh. drown them and have another kid or you buy them a ventriloquist dummy <laughs> right yeah is ventriloquism a step up from unicycling it's unicycling ventriloquism magic oh boy any of those things, that gets you kicked out of the house quicker than announcing you're gay, you know? <laughs> Oh my God, where were you raised? An Amish community, clearly. <laughs> Apparently so. You should have brought in some of those balloon sculptures you worked on when no one was looking. See how they responded to that, Bo? I never showed anyone except you. <laughs> squeaker, 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 squeak. <laughs> Young Bo here just raised his own house. Squeaker, 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 squeak. With the chimney. That's the devil's work. Be gone with you. I would love a movie about a <laughs> balloon artist in an Amish community being kicked out on account of <laughs> practicing the devil's work of creating things from long mm -hmm. balloons. You know what you would call it? <laughs> Go on. Witness returns. <laughs> So, back on the street, uh -huh. this clown grabs Michelle Pfeiffer, who has worked her way down from the office, and he's holding her hostage, and Batman sees this going down mm -hmm. and confronts him, and so he shoots his bat claw, but it l hits the cinder block behind the clown, and the clown is like, ha hey, you missed, and then Batman gives the line a jerk which pulls a chunk of the cinder block out knocking out this clown from the back of his head and michelle pfeiffer gets all moony eyes like oh my god thank you so much are you like professionally a batman or uh is this just something you do on the side and batman mm -hmm. just takes off and she's yeah. like oh well uh i guess you're not the chatty type which i like i like at one point during this chaos boat, Batman turns the Batmobile around and blasts the afterburners, and he melts the guy in the devil costume. 
which I think he killed him. He kills a couple of people in this movie. There's one in particular where you're like, oh, yeah, that guy is definitely dead. Like, maybe this guy got away with, like, third degree burns over 70% of his body and can make a life for himself kind of like Mel Gibson and The Man with No Face, <laughs> where he just befriends a kid and then gets accused of being a pedophile when actually he was just a racist. Those were the days. That's a quick history of Mel Gibson's career. The fact that he is still allowed in movies blows my mind. I like that during this whole scene where Batman shows up to save the day, the majority of his heroic acts involves him pushing buttons and flipping switches. Seeing him fight in this bat suit is one of the least interesting things that happens in any of the Batman movies that he's in, or all two of them. But yeah, it's just him occasionally punching somebody, but mostly it's just him using gadgets, which I kind of prefer, because that's at least more interesting than him awkwardly moving in this suit that allows him to tilt his head in a five degree angle one way or another after batman clocks this guy in the head with the cinder block and he gets into the batmobile and drives off all of the chaos has just stopped Bo. he essentially knocked over two stilt walkers he melted the guy in the devil costume he clotheslined a couple of dudes on motorcycles with different extensions on the batmobile and he knocked out this one clown and that's it yeah we're done and done everybody takes off selena kyle does reach down and grab the taser that the clown was gonna i don't know get her with and she picks it up and gives it a buzz, buzz, and then she reaches down and uh, pulls down the clown's pants and she just shocks his taint and balls for a half hour yeah she digs it as does <laughs> tim burton apparently that's in the director's cut that i wish existed <laughs> oh oh people just walking by what does that smell <laughs> get out of here <laughs> smells like hot like a hot dogs on a roller at a convenience store <laughs> yeah, it smells like stupid corn dogs <laughs> <laughs> so after all of this violence has has passed other than the shocking of the testicles the commissioner <laughs> finds batman and is like no oh, thanks batman for saving the day <laughs> then everybody's like yeah everybody's just fine we saved everyone hey where's christopher walken again <laughs> <laughs> he's heading down some alleyway and he steps on top of a sewer grate which is a trap door and he just so disappears into the sewers below and this is where we get this sweeping camera over the model of the arctic land zoo which i dig i like a good model and this is a good one mm -hmm. and christopher walken ends up in the penguin's lair right we're in arctic world at the zoo right we're yes. not in the sewers yeah six and one half dozen of the other i think it's all connected this is the opposite of everything finding nemo told me <laughs> well finding nemo lied about a lot of things namely <laughs> that you know you can live your dreams and live a happy life <laughs> a lot of a lot of falsehoods pitched in finding nemo <laughs> But Christopher Walken is at this dinner table of freaks with all of them huddled around the end of the table. He's on the other end. There are a bunch of penguins wandering around. It's a bunch of the circus folk that didn't end up getting clotheslined by Batman. Or <laughs> burned alive. There's a fat clown and there's a skinny clown there. The skinny clown in this movie is played by Doug Jones, who was the amphibian man in The Shape of Water, which was a movie about a mute female janitor that has sex with a fish monster. That's a good movie. And he's also the amphibian man in the Hellboy movies. And he's probably played amphibian men in other films and television as well. Doug Jones is secretly in every movie you've ever seen. I thought you were going to say he's secretly an amphibian man. Yeah, well, that's true too. But he's such a, a thin guy. But he's also a pretty good actor, so if you need to pile a bunch of makeup on somebody and have them give a performance, it's Doug Jones that you get. Quick side note on where we are in this movie with all these penguins running around. You ever been to a penguin enclosure yeah. before? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the most rank-smelling place you will ever visit. It smells like fermenting durian fruit inside of a porta potty at the county fair it's disgusting well it's because penguins don't have any reservation about where they piss and shit well i don't either but my house doesn't smell like that well you've got I a good think, cleanup does crew. it i don't know yet i haven't been to the new one i can tell you how the old one smelled kind of like penguins well they, they condemned the old one they well, made me leave i think that might be a, a clue on an upside tlc called me and offered me a series oh that is nice. That means either your house is a disaster or haunted. 
one of the two. They told me if I could hit 600 LBs, they would sign me for three seasons. Oh, that is good. Tell them to mm-hmm. give me a ring. They said if I married a little person, they'd make it four. TLC is just essentially the freak show of television networks. Yeah, it it's one step down from the History Channel, which ain't real good. And neither of them are about history or learning at this point. Mm-mm. Which is how they began. They began with noble intentions. But then nobody wanted to watch that shit. Right. Nobody wants to improve themselves, Chad. What they want to do <laughs> is they want to watch a freak show. <laughs> Well, the way they improve themselves is by making themselves feel better by looking at people that they perceive as being worse off than they are. Yeah. Watching those, like, my 600-pound life shows are just like, yep, I can still get out of bed. I got one (laughs) over on that son of a bitch. I can mostly wipe myself without a stick. Look at this loser. I can wash myself with this here rag on a stick. (laughs) Walken wakes up, and he sees this band of misfits. He looks over, and we are now... Formally introduced to the Penguin, as played by Danny DeVito. And the Penguin says, hey, how you doing? I'm the Penguin. And this is all a bad dream. You're really at home, slowly dying from all the carcinogens that you spew into the atmosphere so you can make money. And I was like, wait a minute. I thought Max Shrek, a.k.a. Christopher Walken, ran a successful line of department stores with a wide array of fashion for both the woman on the go and the man about town. But... He somehow produces toxic waste? He's got his finger in a lot of pies. Um, Mm. But I like when the penguin introduces himself and you get the first look at him. He says, I believe the wood you're looking for is, ah, which is a a, a kind of a fun moment with him. Is he an environmentalist or a naturalist? I thought that was Poison Ivy's angle. No, he is not. He is just using this as black because he says, you and me, we're the same. We're both monsters but you're well-respected. And Christopher Walken's response is, hey, that monster, it's that's a bum rap. Tough, sure. Shrewd, okay. But monster? Then the penguin pulls out like this hypno umbrella mm-hmm. and starts spinning it. And Christopher Walken says, is that supposed to put me in some kind of trance? And he's like, nah, it's just gonna give you a splitting headache. And then fires a blank from the end. Like, he's got this whole arrangement of umbrellas that do special shit, Mm -hmm. uh, including guns and swords and all kinds of stuff. One's a flamethrower. Yeah. How come you can't buy something like that? And I know you can't because I looked it up online. You can buy an umbrella with the retractable blade, but you cannot buy one that shoots fire yet. Well, it's like, why can't you buy an automatic weapon? Well, that's illegal. But you can buy a semi-automatic weapon, and there are plenty of do-it-yourself videos on YouTube to show you how, well, if you just file this thing down, bada-bing, bada-boom, you got yourself an automatic weapon. You think there's a video on YouTube of how to turn an umbrella into a flamethrower? Are you not subscribed to my channel? <laughs> it's nothing but how to turn other stuff into flamethrowers. Are you, Wait, you're Flambo? That's me! I'm Flambo. Holy shit! Yeah. Like, you want to turn an apple into a flamethrower? You want to turn an umbrella into a flamethrower? You know, the one I liked most was when you turned a flamethrower into a flamethrower. That was genius. (laughs) Yeah, that one was tough, because on the surface, it seems like a lot of your work is done for you, but really, Uh you can make it way more destructive. So, the penguin says he wants to be reintroduced to society. Look, I didn't go through all this trouble of sending clowns and tightrope walkers and carnies and a poodle lady and a poodle dog into the snow-covered streets just to bring you down an alleyway and have you go down a trap door to end up here in the city zoo just to kill you, Christopher Walken. I got a plan. I want to emerge. And with your help and your know-how and your savvy, I want to be recognized by my family and find my parents and learn my human name. And Christopher Walken wisely says, why on earth would I help you? (laughs) I got a bunch of toxic waste from your clean textile plants, and I got all these documents that show you own half the fire traps in Gotham, and here's the arm of your dead partner. Need I go on? The way he phrases this, the penguin says, you flush it, I flaunt it. Uh And Christopher Walken says, you know, on second thought, I think we can help each other out. 
<laughs> so he's going to help him reintroduce Penguin into society. We cut back to Michelle Pfeiffer, who is returning home from her long uh-huh. day of being abused by her boss, only to be abducted by a clown, and then to fry his testicles for about 45 minutes to three hours. <laughs> she starts off with a, honey, I'm home. Oh, right. There's no one here. Yeah. Uh, and you just do this tour of her sad life where she plays some messages on the answering machine from her mom about like why haven't you called me back and her boyfriend calls up and cancels a vacation plan or something he doesn't cancel the vacation he just says he's going alone oh and so she's left by her boyfriend her mom's being a real pain in the tulkus there's a message promoting gotham lady perfume on yeah. her machine which I thought that was going to go somewhere. It doesn't. And then lastly, there's a message that says, Hey, Selena, unless you remember the Bruce Wayne files, you have to come back to the office earlier. And one other detail that we skipped when she comes inside, she goes over and the window to her apartment is open, even though it's winter, and a cat jumps in. And then she pours the cat some milk, much to Bo's disapproval. It's not good for cats. If you're giving your cat milk, you're making a mistake. I had somebody one time get all high and mighty about how humans are the only species that drink another animal's milk you know repeatedly yeah I, and it's not wrong. i was like you know what human beings are also the only species that drive cars and make pornography and you know made the olsen twins famous humans do a lot of stupid shit what's your point <laughs> our evolved brains have led us to a number of self-destructive behaviors yes <laughs> And I, like and milk is good i like milk i like milk too like i know it's bad for you you're actually not supposed to drink a lot of milk it, says it, it, who it says science science ah, has, has come in what and do they like, know yeah ah. bunch of eggheads there's also a neon sign in michelle pfeiffer's bedroom that says hello there that's odd isn't it it's very strange but it leads to a great shot later and that's why you have it there did you make quotation marks around the word great when you said that no i like it uh. but yeah so she's got to go back to the office which she does christopher walken shows back up from his sewer <laughs> adventure where and finds michelle pfeiffer going through a bunch of cabinets and he's like what are you doing and she's like well i was <laughs> putting together the notes for your meeting with bruce wayne that's going to happen in a few minutes in this movie and <laughs> i also got into your protected files and he's like protected files how'd you do that she says well i guess that your password was geraldo the name of your stuffed chihuahua that you've got on this filing cabinet which isn't creepy at all i also noticed that the power plant you're proposing is more of a capacitor which means it's just gonna suck all the power of gotham into it and christopher walken's like "Uh uh-huh hey let me ask you a question what did curiosity do to the cat michelle pfeiffer says you know this can all just be our secret Listen, I'm going to back you up to this window. Go ahead. You can intimidate me. You can bully me. It's not like you can kill me. Actually, it's a lot like that. He leans in and kind of gives it this lunging laugh. And then Selena starts laughing uncomfortably a bit. And she says, "Uh, for a second there, you frightened me. And then just Christopher Walken pushes her through a window where she falls 15 to 20 stories, ripping through multiple awnings and crashes to the ground below where she is immediately killed by gravity. And then a bunch of cats come out and start to eat her corpse. And this is the sad truth of things. If you are a cat owner and you die, cats will immediately start eating your soft tissue. So (laughs) you're welcome for that image. I want to pause for a moment. Christopher Walken has an evil plan to build some sort of facility that stores power that one assumes could be used later. Like if you have a surplus of power, is that a bad thing? He's not like sucking their power to sell at a profit or to sell to someone else. I think that's the idea is that he is going to suck the power from the gotham power plant and resell it to them although but they don't say that yeah i know this is why i don't like tim burton movies give your villain a like just have him say that i'm gonna steal the power and resell it at a profit and fuck everybody over and tim burton just doesn't give a shit about that i'm building a legacy for my son chip he's not the brightest bulb on the christmas tree have you heard how he talks It's all wrong. It's ridiculous. He's always putting these pregnant pauses in his speech. So after these cats start to eat her fingers and ears and nose, she pops an eye open and she is alive once more. 
And I don't think, technically, I don't think she's ever actually dead the way that the Halle Berry Catwoman was. But it it's very similar to that where she's just mostly dead. Is that Catwoman's origin story? I don't know anything about Catwoman other than what I watched from this movie and that Halle Berry thing we watched a few seasons ago. But I always thought she was just a like a cat burglar. And- yeah. She could beat people up and do backflips and stuff. Like, she doesn't have superpowers. She's not a zombie like she is in this movie. Like, I haven't read the old school Detective Comics origins of Catwoman. But in all the modern comics, then yes, exactly. Catwoman is a burglar who tends to steal from the wealthy and uses that money to help her and her friends. The movie cuts back to her apartment and we get a redo of the scene we just saw where she returns home from her apartment. But this time she's in a catatonic (laughs) pun intended state and she says honey i'm home oh i forgot i'm not married and she pours cat for the milk much to bo's disapproval and then she guzzles the carton of milk she hits the answering machine again now keep in mind this is like what a few hours since the previous time she hit the answering Uh machine and there's a whole nother slew of messages from her mom she should call her mom Something might be going on, like somebody might be sick or dead or in the hospital. Yeah, she doesn't care about that. She's very distanced from her family. Her mother is probably one of those crazy moms that gets juiced up on tequila and just calls. Just calls you later. Yeah. Like, hey, you think you're better than me because you got a job? How come you dropped out of college? I just want an answer. You, I, Whatever the answer is, I'll accept it. I just want to know why. Be nice to get a call on my birthday. Son of a bitch. For once in a while. Bitch. There's a final message that is another ad for Lady Gotham Perfume. And this one has a tagline that says, one whiff of this and your boss will ask you to stay late and fuck him. And that just pushes Selena Kyle over the edge. And she just goes full no wire hangers and starts smashing her apartment up. Crams all her stuffed animals down the garbage disposal. Uh, I don't know. She grabs an iron skillet and starts smashing the walls, which look like fun to me. When the people show up to throw me out of this house because of the smell, I'm going (laughs) to smash things up with an iron skillet before they drag me out. And it's kind of a nice touch where you see Michelle Pfeiffer basically destroying objects of innocence and using the traditional female, like you associate a woman being in the kitchen with the iron skillet and so forth. And she Uh. is using that as a cudgel to bust up her apartment and so there's this idea of like the death of innocence and traditional female roles and that kind of thing and every wall is painted pink and she starts spray painting them black yeah she spray paints like the inside of a dollhouse yeah it's a real death of innocence kind of moment Mm -hmm. and she's becoming a woman not just a woman chad a cat woman because she Mm -hmm. grabs this latex coat that she has i think it's just a raincoat and starts cutting it up and restitching it together Uh and she also as she's walking into the bedroom she smashes the neon sign but we Uh don't get a clear look at that until we see her kind of stitching the catwoman costume together she knocks out the o in hello Uh and she knocks out the t in there yeah so it says hell here that's kind of like typing 80085 on a calculator and showing it to your buddies for a laugh. There is also a shot of her prior to her <laughs> actually putting on the costume where she is all like manic and her hair's kind of frizzed out and stuff. And it's just like Tim Burton said to himself, how much like Helena Bonham Carter can I make Michelle Pfeiffer look? Yeah. Because she does in a lot of this movie. It's no wonder that when he met Helena Bonham Carter, he was like, we are going to get married. She stitches together this raincoat. She fits needles on the glove of, of the thing, like sewing needles and whatnot. And then that's where we get the outside shot of Catwoman now in her costume. And she, over the shot of the hell here neon sign and the shot through the window, she says, I don't know about you, Mr. Whiskers, but I feel so much yummier. (laughs) If you were a young boy watching this movie, you had a coming of age in this moment. I think I just became a man. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, really, it is that. This movie is horny as hell, and it starts right here. We cut to the steps of City Hall, where the mayor is holding a press conference, and then an acrobatic thug does a back handspring into one of these, and he nabs the mayor's baby. He hops on the microphone and says, 
I'm not one for speeches, so I'll just say thanks. And then he disappears down an open manhole. And if you're scoring at home and noticed that the acrobatic thug in Batman Returns is played by Gregory Scott Cummins, a.k.a. Max Dad, who is perpetually incarcerated on It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, give yourself a hundred extra bonus points and take the rest of the night off. That's extra pick six points, which you can redeem for (laughs) extra sarcasm. You think that guy and DeVito ever talked about this movie on the set of It's Always Sunny? I'm sure. Like, apparently, (laughs) I didn't put this in the introduction, but apparently DeVito has a sketch of the penguin that he carries with him in his wallet. Well, that's not weird. Look, DeVito is a deeply weird dude. Uh, Let's (laughs) just be honest about it. Like, he's amazing. I love Danny DeVito, but Danny DeVito is a deeply weird dude. I don't know that I want to scratch the surface too deeply on that. Yeah, yeah, I know. I know. The story of him just being always in character on the set like what a horrifying co-star to be around and by the way that kind of bullshit that daniel day lewis and jim carrey in man on the moon just cut that shit out yeah how about we all just work as a team on this set and not be a weirdo prima donna right you're fucking pretending to be this person and then they say cut and then you're just normal yeah You know what? I need to get on the internet and see if somebody will have thoughts on this. This whole bullshit about like people that play the Joker and how that character gets in your head and fucks with you. Like, give me a goddamn break. I don't disagree with any of that. I think that if you descend into a level of, oh, this part is driving me crazy. It's like, well, then you need a therapist. Like, that's not how this is supposed to work. Literally for hundreds of years, people played villains in theatrical productions and seem Mm -hmm. to walk away from it just fine. Yeah. Like Heath Ledger, his portrayal of the Joker sent him down a dark path. Like, he's just a drug addict and he OD'd. It's a shame he's an amazing actor and that performance right. as the Joker is incredible, but prescription medicine is what got him. It's not because he was so dark and played the Joker. He, no. he, was, he, he was addicted to pills because pills right. are great. Sure. They can kill you, but they're great. Yeah. But you're probably going to die. Right. Turns out we're all going to die. Also, Heath Ledger died at the right time for that legend to exist. You know, Uh it's like when Kurt Cobain died or when Jimi Hendrix died or any number of other famous people that died kind of at the peak of their popularity Uh where they just become icons at that point because you never got to see him old and fat and you never saw Heath Ledger doing Daddy Daycare 7 because his popularity had waned it, it's just he like i said he died at the right time like it would be like if i died right after lost after dark you know <laughs> when in the peak of my powers it, it's just a sad fact of everybody is looking for a hero in a weird way that's kind of one of the things this movie is about is that everybody's searching for a hero and they just don't exist you know philip seymour hoffman he didn't get that kind of love yeah but he was also chubby and you got to be pretty You think that actor Jesse Plemons is looking to step into Philip Seymour Hoffman's shoes? Because he got all fat. He's in that Jungle Cruise as the bad guy. Yeah, he's good, though. He's got the job. I know. Oh, you know what he should do? He should star in the Philip Seymour Hoffman movie called hoffman returns i just want to see the adaptation of the scene from magnolia where he's calling to order all the porn mags oh you do have that okay well what about (laughs) i want to see him recreate those iconic moments from twister where he's talking about the suck zone oh yeah that would be good (laughs) or the iconic scenes from sin of a woman where he just awkwardly (laughs) is dropping a dime on all of his friends (laughs) but he's not a rat Let's get back to this. Oh, right, right, right. So Max dad steals the baby, goes down the manhole, and then the media is there and they all peek into the manhole and they hear down below Max dad say, wait, it's the hideous penguin man. Here, take the baby. Don't hurt me. And then the penguin emerges up from the manhole with the baby in his arms. And the mayor's so grateful. And then Christopher Walken shows up to help hold this impromptu kidnapping turned return of the penguin as a model citizen who stops children from being abducted. Yes. Hands the baby back over to the mayor and Christopher Walken takes some pictures with him. So it's a real, hey, this guy is, despite all of his terrible features, is uh, an unlikely hero. Uh We do cut to Wayne Manor for a moment where we're about 
40 minutes into our movie and we're getting our second appearance of Bruce Wayne, aka Batman, who to the best of my knowledge has not spoken one word of dialogue in this movie yet. Yeah, that's And he's true. watching all this on TV because that's where Batman gets most of his information, television. And I think based on his socioeconomic level and his proclivity of vigilante street violence, he's watching a lot of fox news hey alfred did you hear about this that the vaccine has microchips they're all tracking us i'm gonna <laughs> blow up the vaccine factory alfred master wayne that sounds like a terrible idea also alfred i don't know if you saw this but uh aaron Rodgers decided that uh he wasn't going to tell people he had covid guy's a real hero more than batman no, ever will no be. master wayne he's a liar he lied to people you've really got to turn this off read a book you know, Alfred, I, I've just decided I'm, I'm not going to get that Fauci ouchie. Master Wayne, I've already given it to you in your sleep. Well, I'm going to take a bath in some bleach then, Alfred. That reverses the effects of vaccines. Very good, Master Wayne. I'll blow you another bleach bath. Thank you, Alfred. Also, <laughs> I hope this penguin guy finds out, you know, who his parents are. I don't know if you heard about this, Alfred, but I have a thing with my parents. Yes, Master Wayne, we've talked about this multiple times today, as we've done every day for the last 35 years. You know, Alfred, I I'm really bothered by the fact that Biden stole this election. The election was certified, Master Wayne. You know, let me go pour that bleach bath for you. Just stay here and try not to harm yourself or yeah. others. Yeah, thanks, Alfred. I'm going to see what I can do to get to the bottom of this whole Dominion voting thing. And so outside the Hall of Records, reporters yeah. have gathered to watch the penguin on his hunt for his parents. Meanwhile, he is kind of secretly doing some under the table research we'll find out about later. And Christopher Walken addresses the crowd outside the Hall of Records. And all the reporters are shouting questions at him and whatnot. My favorite line in this, though, is he says, look, the penguin, he's a friend of the whole city. Also, Give the Constitution a rest. It's Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> when somebody says, like, hey, freedom of the press, give the Constitution a rest. Come on. It's so You good. know who I think really like this movie, Bo? Roger Stone. Yeah, sure. It's amazing he doesn't have, like, a full back tattoo of Max Shrek. I think there's a whole lot of Max Shrek in Roger Stone. The costumes, the throwing of the peace signs, the overthrowing of elections, which happens in this movie. Excuse me. The attempted overthrowing of elections, which happens in this movie. So we cut back to the Batcave where Bruce Wayne is doing a little Steve Jobs cosplay. And he's going over these microfiche files. And Alfred gives Bruce Wayne some soup. And he takes a bite and just spits it out and goes, it's cold. And Alfred says, it's vichy sir. So it's supposed to be served cold. And Bruce Wayne looks at Alfred like Alfred is speaking Klingon. Like he is so confused by the words coming out of his mouth. And like, you're the world's greatest detective. You have an intellect unparalleled by any other man in the city of Gotham. And did I have to look up what Vichy Swa was? Of course I did, Bo, but I'm not the world's greatest detective, am I? In comics, a lot of times, Batman is represented almost like Sherlock Holmes-like, where right. he has obscure knowledge that other people don't, especially when it comes to Gotham itself. And you would think being so, sort of highborn, it's one of those things where you're like, he doesn't know what that is. I, maybe that's supposed to humanize him some and make him less of a, a superhero. <laughs> Why would you want to do that? Or just make him less of an aristocrat or something. But it doesn't make any sense. Bruce Wayne says, hey, Alfred, this old newspaper article says that a circus came to town years ago and there was a fat man and a poodle lady. But listen, let's pay close attention to this part, Alfred. There was an aquatic bird boy. I think that might be the penguin, Alfred. Alfred says, well, does that make you feel better, sir? Knowing that you've brought this poor deformed man down a peg? No. Makes me feel worse, actually, Alfred. I don't like feeling <laughs> bad. Will you make me one of those bass again? Yes, sir. Uh, I'll put extra bleach in it this time. Thanks, Alfred. Also, I, I've been watching some of this news. I think I'm going to get some of those my pillows. We have an account set up for pillows. Yes, we have a line of credit with the my pillow guy. Good, good. He's making a lot of good points. So, very <laughs> inconspicuously, end quote, the Batmobile just starts roaming the neighborhoods of Gotham. And then Alfred, who's catching up on some late night ironing, pops up on closed circuit Batmobile TV. Master Wayne, are you trolling? for prostitutes again i told you i can arrange for female companionship any time that you like batman says no alfred uh, i'm like eddie murphy and hugh grant it's the thrill of possibly getting caught also i think the penguin knows who his parents are also when did we start calling him the penguin 
and there's something else. I'm looking at him inside the Hall of Records. He has no sp- spatial awareness. You gotta be quiet, Alfred. Shh. If you talk too loud, he might look out the window and see me staring at him from this giant car <laughs> parked right outside the window. <laughs> from the most recognizable vehicle in at least Gotham, if not the United States. Alfred, if he sees me, ready the Oscar Mayer Wienermobile. I'll come back in that. <laughs> Maybe a funny car, a nitro burning funny car would be a little less conspicuous. Uh, Call the guy who owns that Bigfoot monster truck. No, wait, that, that might be too big. Alfred, get me the monster's car. <laughs> could you see if you could get a 747? I'll just taxi it around the city. The next day, presumably, <laughs> the Penguin goes to a cemetery where he finds the Cobblepot grave as reporters are gathered outside the gates, and uh-huh. he falls down to his knees and makes this big scene. And uh-huh. when he comes back from his commiserating with the Cobblepot tombstones, he addresses the crowd and he says, Today, I am a man and I have a name. Oswald Cobblepot. Mm -hmm. I was their number one son and they treated me like number two. Which is a line I really like coming out of Danny DeVito's mouth. Perhaps when I held my Tiffany rattle with a flipper instead of chubby fingers, they freaked the fuck out and that's when they decided to kill me. <laughs> yeah, I, I like the, the, that he actually says, they freaked, which is pretty funny. There's these random shots of people reading newspaper headlines that are all glowing about how the penguin is a reformed man and everybody's like, hmm, I like him now. Like, that's great too. We finally get a scene with Catwoman. Remember uh-huh. her? She's in this movie. Uh-huh. We cut to an alleyway where we're greeted by an attempted rape of a woman by a common street thug, Bo. Catwoman shows up and says, "Mm, I love it when a big, strong man's not afraid to show it with someone half his size. Be gentle. It's my first time. Meow. Crack, crack. And then this rapist approaches Catwoman, who is not only a zombie and a seamstress and, you know, part-time Mae West impersonator. She apparently... Also got, I don't know, a bunch of crouching tiger, hidden dragon, kung fu skills when those cats nibbled on her fingers and her nose. That's right. Yeah, she becomes a complete badass at this point. Kicks the shit out of this guy, scratches him up real good, and he runs off. Oh, cat women. The lady who was almost raped says, hey, thanks a lot, weirdo. And then cat women face palms this woman to the wall and says, you make it so easy, don't you? Waiting for some Batman to save you. I'm cat woman hear me raw meow and then she backhand springs like she's max dad getting ready to go steal a baby so michael keaton shows up at christopher walken's office for this mm-hmm. meeting that was alluded yep. to earlier mm-hmm. and michael keaton is like you know max i read over your proposal here for your power plant and mm. it gotham has a power surplus i think you might remember that from that first scene too much power there's no such thing as too much power my life has a meaning that's the meaning no such thing as too much power yeah i I got a fever brucey and there's just one thing that's gonna cure it more power don't pull back on the power too much i think you're gonna realize that you want it also i'm sorry i don't have any coffee for you my secretary who's the only one who knows how to work the coffee maker she decided to take a vacation through that open window over there Okay, thirsty and get you a salsa, juice, tea, anything but coffee. Ovaltine. Sanka. (laughs) Michael Keaton says, I've already spoken to the mayor and he agrees with me. And also just because he doesn't have a penguin crime boss in his back pocket doesn't mean we won't win. Wait, wait, wait. The Penguin is now a crime boss? Well, Michael Keaton says here, look, I know the Penguin controls the Red Triangle gang, whatever that is. Uh, right. Sure, that's a new thing. And he says, I can't prove it yet. But later tonight, Tucker Carlson has a special report that's going to lay out all the details. So, the Red Triangle gang, is the Penguin running it? I'm just asking questions. And in (laughs) comes Michelle Pfeiffer, and Christopher Walken does a great job here of being like, wow. Wow, 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 wow. 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 I thought I killed you. And (laughs) Bruce is a real smitten kitten when she walks in as well. We've actually, we've met before. When I saved your life, when I was dressed up as Batman. I I mean, when I saw a guy who looks just like me dressed up as Batman who wasn't me. And that other guy who looks like me but isn't me saved your life when he, I, he yanked the concrete out of the wall and hit that clown. We met then. Because I was him, watching him, not me. Also, why do you have a bandage on your head? Why does it say Les Nessman on it? Christopher Walken jumps in and is like, oh, 
Well, she was on that ski trip. Sledding down the side of this building very quickly with no skis. You decided that you were going to try the luge and then went barreling off the side. Start with the bunny slopes. I told you to start with the bunny slopes. So, you know, we're cool, right? And she's like, well, yeah, it's weird because I have one of those while you were sleeping amnesias <laughs> where I remember everything but yesterday. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, how about you show Michael Keaton out? We got to pause this conversation for just a moment because yes. you said something really important there. She says, don't remember everything like since yesterday. And the meeting with Batman or Bruce Wayne is happening on Wednesday, which is today. And the scene where she went back to get the reports for this meeting was yesterday. So everything that has happened in our movie occurred between the time she got pushed out the window to right now. Unless, like, she's just compressed time. Like, she's just been knocked unconscious for a few days and is viewing it as one day. That's the only logical explanation. But the reality of it, as I see it, is that Tim Burton can't tell a story at all. And there's no way all of this shit with Cobblepot going to the Hall of Records and then reintroducing him to society. Like, all of that didn't happen in the last day. I mean, maybe they rescheduled the meeting with Bruce Swain. I don't know. All right. I wasn't paying attention to who's doing what now that Selena Kyle, you know, has gone missing and they've got a temp in there taking care of shit. But it, it's the little things that matter. Yeah. That one of the better descriptions I've heard of this problem that Burton has in general is that he's more concerned with the beads than the necklace. And so the individual moments are very good, but they just don't string together very well. That's fair. And I just have a hard time with that when I'm like, wait, who, what? He's a crime boss? Like, yeah. I mean, watching a Tim Burton movie, it, like, you have to kind of either give yourself over to that or it's just going to drive you crazy. Um, I'm in the second camp. As Michelle Pfeiffer is taking Michael Keaton to the elevator, there's a whole lot of banter, you know, 1930s high society comedy style. And he ends up asking her out and blah, blah, blah. This all work itself out later. Uh-huh. And then Christopher Walken, again, shocked by the fact that Michelle Pfeiffer is still alive. Chip, get in here. Let me ask you sure, a question. Dad. Look at my outfit. Do I look like Jack Skellington, the Pumpkin King? Because that's what I was going for with the stripes and the tie and the hair. It's a little like that, Dad. Why do you talk like that? You sound like a crazy person. Look. I didn't know Michelle Pfeiffer was coming back, but if she tries to blackmail me, I'll drop out a higher window. In the meantime, I've got bigger fish to fry. Cut to the penguin, who's still writing the names of children on legal pads. And then it seems like we're upstairs in this unfinished house or office building. All of his circus folk crew are sitting off to the side. Christopher Walken shows up and he says, Hey, Cobblepot, come downstairs. I'm going to make it worth your while. I brought you a fish to eat. That's what he lures the penguin <laughs> downstairs with is a raw fish. It's like Scooby-Doo with his Scooby snacks. Huh? <laughs> DeVito just starts chewing on this raw fish and downstairs, Christopher Walken has assembled this whole Cobblebot for mayor operation. What? What? When did this happen? It's a good question, but he's got asses in the seats here if the penguin points out this he's like hey elections are in november this is late december and walken says ah don't worry about it this is the whole like recall <laughs> thing that he mentioned earlier in the movie that's what the writer said they're like how do we explain this ah don't worry about it there's a lot of that going on in this movie oh for sure <laughs> and christopher walken introduces him to image consultants one of whom is jan hooks uh-huh the late great jan hooks yeah she was on saturday night live and she also gave tours at the alamo where she introduced us to her two friends pedro and Inez. it described the <laughs> Mexican word for corn is maize. <laughs> so she wants to put some gloves on him because she says that people in their polling seem to like five fingers as opposed to mutant hands. Uh-huh, that's true. And he kind of growls at her. And then this dude, Josh, who's the other image consultant, is like, well, we want to give you a makeover because I guess there aren't a lot of reflective surfaces in the sewer. And yeah. they all start laughing, including the penguin. <laughs> And he says, well, it could be worse. My nose could be gushing blood. And they continue to laugh. And then Josh is like, well, wait a second. I don't know if I understand that. And then the penguin just bites his nose <laughs> so that yeah. it now gushes blood, which uh -huh. is pretty good. But Christopher Walken is like, um, all right, everybody back to work. We're going to deal with this whole nose situation in a minute. There are more people 
in this impromptu campaign office than were at the Christmas tree lighting ceremony. Well, sure, Christopher Walken wasn't forcing his employees to be at the Christmas tree lighting. <laughs> Walken pulls the penguin aside and he says, look, elections can be overturned. We just have to storm the Capitol, beat police officers with flagpoles, waving the stars and stripes, smear shit on the walls, and then... We hang the vice president. Bingo, bango. We get an election do-over. He actually says, what we need is an inciting incident, like a Gulf of Tonkin or a Reichstag fire. What the fuck? We're <laughs> talking about Nazi Germany in a Batman movie? Uh-huh. The penguin is like, oh, you want me to get my clowns to create a little chaos? I think we can do that. The Penguin also, at one point in this conversation, looks over at Jan Hooks, who's nursing the gaping hole on her partner's face. And the Penguin goes, mm, I'd like to fill her void. Teach her my French flipper trick. Yeah. Which is not even a thinly veiled sexual innuendo. Because the Penguin is now incredibly violent, and he's a fourth degree horn dog. And in watching this with my wife, she informed me that on a season of American American Horror Story, there was a guy who had flipper hands and he would flipper fuck women with those hands. Huh. My words, not hers. Yeah, that sounds like an American Horror Story thing. <laughs> I was just wondering, had you heard that? I did not. I watched a few episodes of uh, American Horror Story. I've, I've, I've seen like the first three seasons of that. Uh -huh. And as much as I love horror movies and uh, do, that show is not for me. Oh, what about flipper fucking? Also, not what I'm searching Pornhub for. But if I run across it, like if I hit a, a <laughs> stepmother flipper fucking, maybe not say no. <laughs> When Walken is talking to DeVito, or after the German Nazi reference, Walken leans into the penguin and he says, just think about it. You, it's the mayor. You can reclaim your birthright. You'll have access to captains of industry and unlimited poontang. Which, say what you will about the Zack Snyder movies, they never use the word a poontang. You say that like that's a positive. I disagree. I think that Christopher Walken saying Poontang in your movie is a net positive. <laughs> I don't care what movie it is. It could be superhero or not superhero. Or if he just shows up to lean out a door and just go Poontang, then your movie is one star better by that. What if Ted Nugent shows up to sing Wang Dang, Sweet Poontang? Less interesting. Well, turn on Fox News or OAN or whatever and... Any given day, there's a good chance that's going to happen. Well, you know, you got to play the hits. We see a little dog walk into or kind of trot into a shop on some Gotham studio set. Yeah, it's the poodle lady's dog. Then we, not only does that storefront explode, Chad, her more storefronts exploding thanks to RPGs and clowns generally creating chaos and explosions. And then literally out of nowhere, Bo, Batman just shows up. Yeah, he fight some but it's unceremonious like there's chaos and mayhem and then all of a sudden you're like wait is batman in the middle of this yeah he's the worst part of this movie how can that be it's a batman movie and that's the worst part of your movie it's interesting when he's talking to catwoman about being batman but tim burton is just not a very good action director and so the action scenes are really flat did you just hire somebody to do that shit for you yeah it's not very good and there's a bit where he has to use this remote controlled battering to take down some of the uh, clowns and this is the scene where he grabs some dynamite off of one clown mm -hmm. and then shoves it down the pants of another clown and kicks him into the sewers where we just see the explosion as batman wantonly murders a dude by blowing him up with dynamite uh, you could make the argument that when the explosion happens it's confetti that comes up out of the sewer i believe it's entrails that's what i thought it was and even if they're clown entrails which i guess is once you become a clown once you go to clown college your intestines are replaced by confetti i think is how that works uh -huh. confetti and glitter uh-huh and i think when you fart it goes Ooga. <laughs> they call that a charles nelson riley ectomy when batman throws this batarang and clocks some dudes on the head the little poodle dog snatches it in its mouth and runs off which that comes into play a little bit later yeah sort of about this time catwoman she's out for a stroll and she goes into a christopher walken department store where she grabs a bullwhip because she needs that to complete her ensemble two security guards show up and pull guns she cracks the guns from their hands with her whip in that scene one thing that 
happens after the department store thing with Catwoman. Batman is beating up some clowns, and when he throws one of them, we get a, an old-fashioned Wilhelm scream, uh-huh. which you have heard us talk about on this show prior, and I adore it when a big-time movie uses that particular bit of stock audio. It really makes me happy. I wish they would replace it with a goofy scream. You know that, <laughs> As opposed to the, ow! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, eh, you know, six and one. Chad, the, the question is, why do you have to make that choice? Why not both? You're right. Column A and column B. Yeah. So after Catwoman harasses some guards. We see her go in and she exposes a canister that says gas yeah. on the outside of it. And then she pops a couple of aerosol cans in a microwave oven and turns it on to create an explosion that we will see here in just a moment. We cut back to Batman. He's walking along and he finds the penguin just standing around and batman says hey what do you want the penguin is that what i call you the penguin is there any and the cat woman backhand springs into the street and she says meow and then the building behind her explodes cat woman then scales a nearby building like she's spider-man and the penguin whips out an umbrella that has a helicopter blades on top of it and he flies away like inspector gadget where do these technological capabilities come from and she can just climb buildings now that's right all of that stuff is true uh, one thing i like in the encounter with the penguin is when batman uh first confronts him and is like hey what are you doing here couple putt also did you hear that ted nugent's gonna be on a way in tonight so i i need to kind of hurry up and get back for that i asked alfred to record it on the vcr but he's not good with technology he's not like me or you he's not like us and the penguin gives him a speech about like oh i'm surveying the damage upstanding maya type stuff one of my clearest memories of this movie when it came out is this line from the trailer that you get here where penguin says you don't think you'll win do you and i don't know what he's referring to exactly but it's a good line it just has no context my clearest memory from seeing this movie the first time was that i smuggled four or five cans of keystone light beer <laughs> into the theater with me and just got tanked that eh, feels right yeah doesn't it doesn't it yeah that sounds familiar you just cut out the lining of the jacket and they slide right in nobody knows nothing i'm a genius uh sir come with me <laughs> oh shit i line my coat pocket with plastic that way i can take in some soup too you take it to the buffet you eat your fill and then you put it in the plastic bags you got another meal later that night hey penguin have you ever had bichy soie? it's cold i think you'd like it i've got some here in my pocket when i go to the buffets i like to take a little home with me i've also in this breast pocket i've got some nachos and then in my back pocket i've got some biscuits that i took from the bar batman makes his way to the rooftops where he and catwoman just start beating each other up for no good reason does he even know who or what catwoman is no but she he saw that she blew up a building and i guess also he's a little horned up himself and i was I, like well i can either go after the overweight freak or the hot chick in the latex. I think I'm going to go after her. She punches him a lot. And then he finally just, he has enough. So he clocks her one. And she's like, oh, you hit me. I'm a woman. He's like, oh, I'm sorry. And then she beats the shit out of him some more. And then Batman falls off the side of the building. But he grabs onto Catwoman's whip. And then out of nowhere, probably beside the biscuits or the nacho cheese, he pulls out this blue vial of something. Acid? Question mark. Throws it at her and it explodes. And she's like, ah, it burns or something and then he falls and she falls but they both land on a ledge that's like six inches below him so all of that worry of is batman gonna fall is for naught and then she has this moment where she's like where's the man inside the bat suit and she rubs his chest and his belly and i'm like oh she's gonna grab his dick but instead she just takes her claws and sticks them in his side and then he punches her and she falls off a building again and crashes down into a truck that's driving by with an open roof trailer that's full of sand, I guess. And then Catwoman pops up and she's like, oh, saved by kitty litter and then she takes a shit outside of the box just to be a jerk about things <laughs> sure yeah i got one of them back in the bat cave batman pulls one of the needles from his side left by catwoman and calls alfred for some antiseptic and alfred's <laughs> like is this uh some more of that vaccine stuff he's like no no alfred this time really i got i got attacked by this woman in a sexy cat outfit oh i'm sure you did uh, so i've told you i can arrange for female companionship the ointment that you need is it for the anus 
Or is it for your gentleman's business? You know, it's for my side, but bring the anal stuff, because I've got <laughs> some plans for tonight, Alfred. Hey, did you record uh, Tucker for me tonight? Yes, sir. Uh, I recorded Mr. Carlson's program. Did you get Judge Janine? Yes, sir. Good. I like when she drinks wine. That's every episode, sir. Yeah, that's right, Alfred. That's why I like every episode. So I want to give you an early Christmas present. It's a, it's a library card. I thought maybe you could spend some time at the public library reading a book or two. Less time watching the television. Alfred, I, I just don't have that kind of time. It's way better when these talking heads on television shows tell me yes. the things that I need to know. Yes, some things you don't need to know. No one needs to know them, sir. Well, I'll take you to the library on story day. Can you gas up the Batmobile? I'm going to take it to the border. There's some real trouble brewing down there. Consider it done, sir. Consider it done. Thanks, Alfred. Meanwhile, <laughs> on the streets, we have these cobble pot for mayor signs unfurling, and the this penguin. Has been three days, Bo. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> the the penguin gives this big speech, saying, "I may have saved a mayor's baby, but I refuse to save a mayor." And he gives this whole speech about how the mayor has basically done Gotham wrong by being incompetent, and as he's ascending the steps back. To his attic lair uh-huh there's a sexy young lady who says i gotta tell you mr cobblepot you're the best role model a young person can have and he says oh you're the hottest young person a role model can have and then says you ever been flipper fucked dude he gives her a button and puts it on her and just feels her up yeah. as he's doing so again this movie is horny as shit and speaking of he heads up into the attic lair and there is catwoman yeah also all of his squatting circus folk are still hanging around upstairs well, which sure. let's be honest they are not practicing any form of personal hygiene hell they got a monkey with them for god's sake well yeah it's not like these people have day jobs or showers or <laughs> deodorant can you imagine the smell it's like being at a penguin enclosure bo dude when he sees Catwoman. The line that comes out of his mouth is just the pussy I've been looking for. And you had to think that Burger King and all these places that were doing tie-in deals with this movie were like, whoa, whoa, yeah. whoa, whoa. What did he just say? Did he just use pussy in this yeah. movie in uh -huh. direct connotation to her vagina yes yeah he sure did mm -hmm. that's what happens when you give tim burton a final cut on a movie catwoman says mm, we need to talk we have something in common it's batman and the whole time penguin just keeps making comments about how he wants to fuck catwoman and then the penguin says hey look we got blueprints to the batmobile we're going to blow him up. And if you're wondering how we got him, my friend Christopher Walken said, eh, don't worry about it. And Catwoman is like, that'll never work. We have to turn Batman into us. And Penguin says, well, why should I trust you? They're doing this weird dance around this cage. Uh -huh. And so Catwoman grabs this bird that's in the cage and starts to eat it. Yeah, she's like Sylvester with Tweety Bird. She yeah. just grabs it and boom, right in her mouth. Which, fun note totally legit this was a real bird that michelle pfeiffer really put in her mouth for this scene and, and held it in her mouth yeah like in an interview after she was like i just didn't think about it but like there was probably all kinds of like hygiene and infection worries that i should have thought about <laughs> so while she's got the bird in her mouth penguin puts hit one of his umbrella swords against the throat of this cat yeah that she brought along with her yeah. as a companion uh, i think she just attracts him i don't think she's <laughs> showering much either these days <laughs> because they're at this kind of impasse she lets the bird out of her mouth that flies away again a totally <laughs> legit thing it, that is not an effect that is michelle pfeiffer opening her mouth and letting a bird fly out of it which god bless her like it's cool i'm glad that she did it but that's still crazy yeah. and then penguin lets go of the cat and he says all right all right a plan is for me yeah and catwoman says oh yeah i want in the thought of busting Batman makes me feel dirty. Why does she hate Batman again? Because he's a guy? I think it's that she was saved by Batman and that made uh -huh. her feel weak. And all of Catwoman is a reaction to her feeling weak and insecure and overlooked and all of that. So Batman sort of represents that over-masculine kind of I'm glad person. I have here you here to explain this shit to me. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's what I do, man. Because I'm just like, ah, just don't think about it. Yeah. Just let it go. Have a good time. Then she gives herself a cat bath by licking Ugh. her hand. Yeah, it's just one of those things that where I'm like, this is a bridge too far, even for me, who is enjoying <laughs> a lot of this movie. But her giving herself a, I'm going to lick my hand and rub my head kind of bath is a little stupid. Yeah. I'm just glad she didn't spread her legs and go for the neither regions. You're glad of that? Yes, I am. I am not. So Michael Keaton. <laughs> He's at home watching Fox News where he gets all of his information on tv fox news is real behind the penguin at this point uh -huh. and he's giving a press conference where he says i challenge the mayor to relight this christmas tree wait it's still christmas oh yeah 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 it's <laughs> i think it's like two days till christmas all the entire movie it's like just trapped in this bubble universe it's like the polar express it's perpetually five minutes till christmas day i'll take your word for it that movie creeped me out i couldn't watch it you watch some of the most deviant shit from a Across the globe and you're creeped out by the polar express yeah the character animation in that makes me really uncomfortable well we've learned something about you today haven't we Bob? i suppose we have penguin goes on to say and i challenge batman to be here at the christmas tree lighting to keep the peace we've only got a few days left till christmas we're gonna get really weird with it or a month it might be July. Who's to say? Who knows? Yeah, and so Michael Keaton then runs into Michelle Pfeiffer when he's out Christmas shopping or something. Uh-huh. She's looking in this storefront window, and she's like, you fried Oreo ding -a -ling, you funnel cake phony. Yeah, she kind of wonders aloud, like, what are you doing? A lot of this movie has to deal with the dichotomy of the two lives that both she and Batman sort of lead. But uh -huh. as they're walking down the street, they're, they kind of meet, and they're kind of chatting together and stuff and he's like oh yeah the news been pretty weird lately have you been watching yeah, fox yeah. news are you a fox news person and she's like oh yeah i love it she says i can't believe the press writes these stories about catwoman weighing 140 pounds i mean as if i know she's got to be like what 160 180 no i'm not i mean she's not that fat have you ever had catwoman punch you in the face i have i mean i saw a guy get punched by her i saw batman get punched by her i was there watching first person view but i mean it felt like i was there i heard about it on tucker and he said that it would hurt a lot and then he used to say are you gonna go to this tree lighting thing for nerds and she's like no i'm not going to that tree lighting thing for nerds and he's like hey how about you come over to my place then and we'll watch a little tucker and then the uh -huh. tree lighting on tv how about that and she's like um i think i have something to do that night and he's like okay how about an early dinner like five o'clock earlier we could just we could watch the five do you like the five i know it's a lot of different opinions it's not as good as tucker but we could watch that uh all right i can be there at six and he's like great six o'clock sounds great I i'll pick up some chick-fil-a sound good <laughs> some chick-fil-a and some papa john's how about that <laughs> and meanwhile the ice princess <laughs> is in her tent or her dressing room practicing uh -huh. for her role that night where she says okay the christmas tree is lit and then i hit the button no wait that's stupid i hit the button and then the christmas tree is lit and the penguin busts in and is like hey now's your time for your star and roll and then knocks her out with the battering that the dog stole and you're like oh did he just kill her because that's what's implied it is yeah you you see this happen like you needed to see her get bonked in the head and give a like oh there goes the day but instead he just throws the battering and you hear her kind of grunt off screen then we get the scene with michael keaton and michelle pfeiffer where they're having dinner this presumably is after dinner because they're on his couch sitting in front of a roaring fire chit-chatting you know she's asking him if he's got a girlfriend and he's like no well i did who's your favorite friend on fox and friends do you feel like america reports is way too liberal he says i had a girlfriend but she had trouble reconciling my two truths mm. and well maybe i had trouble reconciling them anyway i don't want to come off sounding like a sicko and she says mm. sickos don't scare me i like to date the weirdest freaks i can find <laughs> and then they kiss passionately and yeah. as they're making out she touches his side and he's like "Ooh, ow out not there and then he touches her arm and she's like "Ooh, ow not there not there and then 
in the background, Fox News has a breaking story about the ice princess being kidnapped. Yeah. Sean Hannity comes on and he just starts talking about how this is all the current administration's fault. And they're like, we're going to cut to the commissioner live now. And the commissioner is like, well, just because I've got this bag with a bloody battering in it doesn't mean that the Batman killed the ice princess. All the evidence is circumstantial. I know that there was a note here that says, ha ha. I killed the ice princess. Commissioner Gordon and the Gotham PD are all a bunch of suckers. Ha ha. Cheers, Batman. Circumstantial evidence. <laughs> P.S. Commissioner Gordon is big fat pig. You know what? This might be Batman. I heard him say that one time behind my back. Uh, this is probably <laughs> for all the times I called him when I was having dinner instead of doing police work. <laughs> Oh, Batman and Catwoman, they see this and we get a little comedy of errors where they're both trying to put their clothes on so they can run off to go do their respective whatever it is they're going to go do. Yeah. And Selena asks Alfred to pass along her reason for a quick exit via a sonnet or dirty limerick. And Alfred's like, indeed, I have a passion for writing dirty limericks. It usually is, involves a man's genitals or a woman's genitals. They're very dirty. Batman and Catwoman then put on their respective outfits. Like Catwoman's changing her car. Batman's picking out his best bat suit from uh -huh. the bat closet. Changing clothes in your car is always harder than you think it's going to be. It's exactly as hard as I think it's going to be. It's a nightmare. I always feel like I get in a car and I'm like, oh, I just need to change my shirt or go from jeans to a pair of shorts. And it just, it turns into a Houdini escape act. It turns into that scene from Plain Streets and Automobiles where you end up. <laughs> <laughs> like putting yourself in a straight jacket made of a Christmas sweater, driving with your teeth so that you don't barrel into oncoming traffic like you're a mother that's got too many kids. We cut to Batman and he's driving the Batmobile into Gotham and he gets out and boop, boop, hits his key fob and the Batmobile is totally protected by bat armor until the circus goons just immediately come around and disarm it with their own key fob boop, boop, and they get under the Batmobile and start tinkering with all of its mechanical innards up on the rooftop batman he's seeing what's doing below at the christmas tree lighting and then he looks across the way and the ice princess who isn't dead and is very much alive is just tied to a chair like pearl pure heart and batman goes over to the building to free her and then catwoman shows up and then these two do some choreographic fighting with a bunch of cringeworthy wordplay the worst of it is batman telling catwoman to eat floor it's high in fiber it's mm -hmm. like Ugh, this is awful and Ultimately, the Catwoman steals the Ice Princess away from Batman. Gotta go, girl talk. <laughs> And so he's climbing the building while she's standing on a ledge above him. The penguin appears and throws this umbrella. And it, it opens up. Right. And bats fly out, which scares the ice princess. And she screams. And I like this cutaway to a guy on the ground looking up in the air because he's clearly not interested in the tree lighting ceremony. And he's like, hey, there's a jumper. I'm glad this group of people are here to see it. And he goes, hey, it's the ice princess. And there's Batman. Wait, did he just push her off the building? Yeah. Is she falling to the ground below? Oh! She eats it here, falls to her death right in front of the mayor. On top of the plunger that lights up the tree, which is pretty funny. Yeah, that's pretty good. And then the bat starts swirling around the crowd. Yeah, the tree was full of bats. How'd that happen? Yeah, and the commissioner Don't Gordon matter. is like, oh boy, this sure looks bad for the Batman. <laughs> and cops show up on the roof. They shoot at Batman, who falls off of the building onto another roof. As Commissioner Gordon is like, wait, hold your fire. What if he has some dirt on me? What Whatever you do, don't aim for the face. Be sure you aim for the butt sign on his chest. When Batman lands on this other rooftop, Catwoman shows up and she pounces on top of him. And then these two are laying together and they're under some mistletoe. What? Okay. And Batman says, you know, mistletoe can be deadly if you eat it. I'm like, what the, what? Like, nine volt batteries are deadly if you eat them, Bo. As are thumbtacks and fiberglass insulation and super glue. <laughs> Also, the human brain weighs seven pounds. I know a lot of science facts like that. And then Michelle Pfeiffer says, Yes, but a kiss can be even deadlier if you mean it. And then she licks his face from chin to nose. You know, Catwoman, everything you write in your diary is not a pearl of wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> then she says, you're the second man who tried to kill me this week. I thought she says you're the second man who killed me this week. Maybe so, Because she says, yeah. I've got seven lives left. Like, she died earlier, right? Uh, the Batman killer? I, no. Well... Maybe I don't. This know. all happened in a week. Oh, we yeah, had yeah, what? Yeah. We there was a baby abduction, reintroducing Cobblepot. Suddenly he's running for mayor. That building got blown up. It's a lot. Full week. So he kicks her off, mm -hmm. and then he goes in search of Ping One, and then he pops out these bat wings, yeah, a la Condor Man, and just flies off into the night as onlookers below scream and yell as bats fly around in the air. And if you want to prove. That you are not the person who killed the Ice Princess. Uh -huh. Don't take a victory lap over her corpse. Right. Don't fly around the crowd like a weirdo. <laughs> but we also see that the clowns have finished up with the Batmobile and they kind of relock it. Boop, boop. Doop, 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 doop. Then the penguin finds Catwoman on the rooftop and he's got like a, a couple of glasses and a bucket of champagne. And maybe my favorite line of the whole movie, Catwoman is like, I thought we were just going to scare the Ice Princess. Says. And he goes, eh, she looked pretty scared to me. <laughs> so, well, now that we've done that, how about you and I, you know, fuck. He says that. Well, he says, we should consummate our relationship. Yeah, which is <laughs> PG-13 for fuck. She says, I wouldn't touch you to scratch you. You dirty minx. You gave off all the signals. Go fuck yourself. And he then pulls out an umbrella, wraps the handle of it around Catwoman's neck, hits a button, and those helicopter propellers pop out and floats her into the air and you know who liked this movie Bo? michael hutchins from nxs oh well yeah robin williams <laughs> kid from world's greatest dad but yeah he says off to heaven with you yeah but we've got about i don't know like 20 minutes left in this movie maybe 30 i don't know i have no idea what the penguins motives are as not even as a villain as a character he was he angry at society is he you know he's writing down these names of these kids now he hates batman i don't understand why he's doing any of this yeah it would make more sense if he hated bruce wayne you know because the undercurrent is like because he was not the perfect child he was discarded by society and now he is going to come back to wreak his vengeance right and there's a great socio-political theme there but it again just kind of mishandled because it's also strange that christopher walken has an issue with bruce wayne but because walken's character is a self-made man and bruce wayne had everything handed to him and he's trying to build something to pass on to his kids kids like i don't know that his argument is necessarily invalid yeah and if we knew for a fact that this power thing that he wanted to build was actually villainous then that would make more sense it's called green energy it's the wave of the future help draft this with aoc <laughs> you know i hate her tucker hates her so catwoman then falls from this hell of umbrella into a greenhouse where she then sits up and screams and all the windows blow out of it for no good reason batman meanwhile uses his glider to not only scare the citizens of gotham <laughs> but to sail back to his car uh -huh. while on the street everybody is kind of on board team penguin now because of this debacle that the mayor oversaw yes and penguin is like yeah yeah i appreciate all your adulation let me go into this trailer for a second yeah and so he gets in this batmobile simulator it looks like a little car that you would find outside of a grocery store that, that's what it is yeah except it's souped up with remote controls where he can drive the batmobile it's the kind of thrown together contraption that you might use on Lewis Tully to determine if he's possessed. Sure. <laughs> Batman gets in the Batmobile, but sure enough, this remote control that the Penguin's flunkies have installed allow him to now capture the controls of the Batmobile. And he pops up on like the little dashboard TV and is like, uh -huh. I got to warn you, Batman, I don't have a license. And he drives this Batmobile through the city of Gotham and just indiscriminately kills a lot of people yeah and while this is happening batman has no control over the batmobile but he does have the forethought to take a cd and throw it in the dash we don't know what he's doing yet but it turns I out i thought he was putting on a little hootie in the blowfish let him drive as he remote controls the batmobile let him drive batman is just like uh oh 
this isn't good. And he just starts flipping switches. I'll push this button. What happens if I toggle this up real fast? Oh no, no, this is working. Maybe if I put in a CD, uh, that didn't work. As cars are being totaled left and right. I did like the practical effects of watching something that resembled the Batmobile just crashing into real cars oh you don't sure. get that in movies like you used to yeah 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 that's a big problem with modern films is an over-reliance on cgi i know it's safer and less expensive and all that stuff but also doesn't look as good no. um but yeah batman then has run a scan on the batmobile and determined that there's this remote control thingy that is connected to the bottom of the batmobile so he punches through the floorboard yes and grabs the remote regains control of the car while penguin is spouting off about like i played the citizens of gotham like a violin from hell among other yeah. things and batman furious with the penguin punches out the video console on the dash take that take that batmobile <laughs> as the penguin screams in frustration that he no longer has control of the batmobile cops are in hot pursuit of the batmobile at this point because he's killed countless people and batman gets away by again pushing buttons and flipping switches which discards about what 30 40 percent of the entire batmobile to where it whittles down and it looks like this big thick black version of the ambiguously gay duo's car <laughs> and he just zips off in this dick mobile it's the BBC version of the ambiguously gay duo car. <laughs> so Penguin is real pissed, but Christopher Walken is giving him a pep talk about like, look, this all went great. I'm good. I'll tell you what, come to the Max Grade Ball. I call it that because my name is Max. You see these people they're chanting your name. They've lost all faith in symbols. They're ready to bond with you. The icon of the future. Put this red truck ahead on. It says, make Gotham great again. They're eating this shit up. It's like Vichy Swa. It's cold soup. You heard about it? It's all the rage. A mega movement is going to be crazy popular. <laughs> MGGA right across the bill. <laughs> and so Penguin then gives this big speech. Roger Stone had to have watched this movie, right? I like this guy's attitude. I like his, his sense of fashion and style. I could do this. I didn't put that together, but he does dress like the Penguin. That is 100% <laughs> true. He dresses like all the Batman villains, but either way. All, all right. at once, yeah. The Penguin gives a big speech about the mayor being a, a total fuck up. And Michael Keaton and Alfred are watching this on Fox News, of course. Alfred is like, you know, perhaps it's time that you got over the fact that uh, you're leading this double life and michael keaton's like hey uh who let vicky vale in here huh alfred if we're gonna start criticizing people you know i have a whole secret identity and i look up and there's vicky bell i'm like oh guess i'm batman alfred i love you you're the only parent that i've got left but also boundaries huh how about you run that past me before you just start letting people into the back cave? you know sir, miss vale isn't even in this movie yeah, but I've talked about her like two times. That's two more times than anyone has revealed a villain plan. So, Alfred, <laughs> put that in your pipe and smoke it, even though you don't smoke a pipe. Bruce Wayne reaches into a fish tank and presses a button on a little model, which opens up this Iron Maiden that Bruce Wayne steps inside. And this is something out of Pee Wee's Playhouse, because the Iron Maiden closes and it just turns into a slide and Batman goes, wee! <laughs> and pops out the tube at the bottom like he's yeah. at a, a playground at a McDonald's or something. And so while the penguin is giving this speech. Walken's behind him, giving yeah. it thumbs up. He's throwing the peace signs. Roger Stone is taking notes. Yeah. Alfred and batman or michael keaton are basically getting the frequency of the the pa system or something i love how you fill in the gaps on this shit they're just like punching buttons and shit yeah but there's a sign on or a, a banner on the computer that's a searching for frequency okay they log in to the frequency of the pa system and michael keaton takes the cd that he recorded from his romp with the penguin controlling the batmobile we didn't know he recorded anything we find that out now Yes, he starts playing back some of the choicer moments from the penguin really ragging on the citizens of Gotham, mm. which it turns out is not a deal breaker politically as we have learned, no. but in this fantasy of the movie people are yeah. upset when you make fun of them don't worry about me i'll take care of the pinheads in gotham and you gotta admit batman i play this city like a harp from hell and john mccain's not a war hero he's only a hero because he got captured and i like people that weren't captured batman also ted cruz's wife is ugly 
And his father probably had something to do with the JFK assassination. <laughs> oh, he's still backing me? Um, Where's Fifth Avenue? Get my gun. The crowd turns on the penguin, and they start booing and throwing vegetables and fruit at him. Cabbage, tomatoes, and eggs. And at one point, he... <laughs> Even Penguin says, why does somebody always bring eggs to these things? When Batman's playing the audio clips, at one point he puts his fingertips on the CD like a DJ would do an album on a turntable and gives it a little wiki wiki sound which that's not how cds work no it's one of the stupider moments of this movie christopher walken steps in he's like ah don't worry about it christopher walken is done with him at this point he's like look i backed the wrong horse what are you gonna do <laughs> by the way you're not invited to the party anymore penguin is chased back over the bridge where he was dumped when he was a kid uh -huh. but this time rather than being thrown over the side by his parents he goes willingly as he embraces that he is no longer oswald Cobblepot, he is in fact the penguin, and uh -huh. says as much when he gets on his motorized rubber ducky that we've seen a couple of times in this movie, where his penguins are in the sewer zoo that they live right. in. And he's like, Hello, my lovelies. And some of the clown flunkies are like, Hey, welcome back, Mr. Cobblepot. And he says, My name is not Oswald Cobblepot. I'm penguin, and I'm not a human being. I'm an animal. Bring me my list of names of all those kids that I wrote down. Are the firstborn of all the families in Gotham tonight. We will all go to the homes of these children and snatch them from their beds and toss them into a deep, dark, watery grave. And the fat clown's like, uh, penguin, sorry, uh, fat clown number one over here. We're going to do what now? Because when I came on board, I was down for public mayhem, some light combat, destruction of physical property, but you're asking us to go commit really serious felonies of kidnapping and this list is like well over, I mean, there's got to be 200 children on here. We're not Santa Claus. We can't do this in one night. The exchange here, I really, really like where the fat clown says that more succinctly by saying, killing sleeping children, isn't that a little, and then the penguin just shoots him at where he goes tumbling into the water and penguin says, no, it's a lot. But I really like that exchange. But yeah, so fat clown number one is now dead and in the water. Does the penguin throw the gun? in the water after fat clown number one because there's a gun in the water later or was that fat clown number one's gun it's his gun i right. think uh, it doesn't matter ah, don't worry about it at the bat cave michael keaton is working on fixing the batmobile thanks to some diy videos on youtube alfred hand me that duct tape and uh give me those uh, bandages and uh some of that dry pasta Think that'll make it work oh no i turned this into a flamethrower i'm watching flame bow oh damn it <laughs> alfred then reminds him sir would you like to go to the max garade ball absolutely not wait is selena kyle gonna be there yes oh i might be able to get it wet all right put me down for a yes then and so we immediately cut to the ball where super freak is playing which is a nice little touch i think who throws a masquerade ball at christmas uh, apparently max shrek does all right it's his famous max garade ball I'm sure it happens annually. And <laughs> Michael Keaton wanders the room in his tux. Christopher Walken finds him. Nice costume, trust fund boy. I had to work for my money. You had it handed to you on a silver platter, you piece of shit. And Michael Keaton tosses back at him. Hey, didn't you almost make a monster the mayor of Gotham? Was there a recall? Was there an election? This happened, what, three days ago? And Christopher Walken's just like, ah, you're a jerk. And then walks off to enjoy his party. <laughs> <laughs> Selena Kyle shows up. And again, it is shocking how little Batman and Catwoman are in this movie. And she comes over and she and Bruce Wayne start canoodling and dancing. And Bruce Wayne says, no hard feelings. And Selena says, hmm, semi-hard. You know, there's a California King bed over in Houseware where we can, you know, go fuck. And before these two can have sex, Selena says, you know, actually, I came here to kill Christopher Walken. And she pulls a derringer from her thigh that's strapped there by a garter. And Selena Kyle is completely nuttered in the head at this point. And I like that she says, don't give me some speech about how this won't solve anything because it would. And I'm like, well, she's got a point, you know? <laughs> That Christopher Walken would then be dead and this power thing would be off the table, mm -hmm. which may or may not be a bad thing. We, we're not really sure about that. Bruce Wayne is all excited about fucking this crazy woman and before she kills somebody. That'd be an evening. He looks up in the air and for some reason there is mistletoe. Seems like hanging over people's heads a lot in this movie. And she says, you know, mistletoe 
can be deadly if you eat it. And Bruce Wayne says, you know, so can nine volt batteries and super glue. But you know what? A kiss can be deadly if you mean it. And then these two give it a, but I said, but you said, but that means, and you are, but I am, ah, brother. She says, does this mean we have to fight now? And he's like, nah, I tell you what, let's just go outside and figure this out. And also probably have some outdoor sex. Better yet, is that California King mattress an option? I'll tell you, let's head that way. Best two out of three wins the night. What do you say? But before they can uh, consummate this weird relationship that they've got brewing, the center of the ballroom explodes and Michael Keaton and Michelle Pfeiffer are kind of thrown apart as are christopher walken and his shitty son chip chip where's chip i'm over here dad you can't talk like that people are gonna think it you know something's wrong with you i learned it from you dad who are you talking to <laughs> the penguin rises up from this smoking hole on his rubber ducky and he tells everyone like while you're here enjoying your fancy party my people are all over town collecting the firstborn sons of gotham and i have personally come for chip shrek hey that's me dad he said my name dead you're such a smart boy he knows his own name watch this chip Hop, hop on one leg. Look at him go. Hopping on a leg. And Christopher Walken gets in between Penguin and his shitty kid Chip. And he's like, look, <laughs> Penguin, how about you take me instead? Yeah, I'm the one you want. Imagine who would you rather kill in those gross sewers that might also be a zoo? Me or that kid? The one hopping on his leg. Penguin is like, well, you, you make a pretty good point. All right, you're coming with me. Even though this runs counter to my dastardly plan, I'll just do whatever you said. So Mike. Michael Keaton runs off to become Batman while in the sewers penguin has christopher walken in a giant cage suspended over his toilet water yeah you left out an important detail go on that when he abducts christopher walken sitting in the four-wheel drive rubber ducky are about six emperor penguins with little metal caps on their heads that are attached to rockets on their back yeah so this is the grand plan that we're gonna get to they look adorable <laughs> And so while Christopher Walken is caged over the, the poop water, Penguin uh -huh. tells him, you're going to get to see all the firstborn children of Gotham sink into these disgusting waters, and then you're going to join them. And we cut away from that to Mr. Vargas driving a big train through town uh -huh. while more of these clown thugs are just putting babies into cages on this train. Yeah, they're just chunking them on this train. It looks like something you would see riding around a slowly failing mall between october and february then we see a shadow of the batman fall across mr vargas yeah he shows up to stop this human trafficking literally or baby murder yeah and then his monkey shows up in the sewers with a note for penguin on official mm. batman stationery, which i like very nice from the desk There's a of batman. batman logo at the top that's classy and it says the children of gotham and regret to inform you that they will not be able to attend love batman p.s <laughs> i'll be there in a little bit pps you suck ah says penguin <laughs> And he then addresses his penguin army that all have the Lewis Tully, <laughs> two references in one episode on that one, of the Lewis I'll Tully allow it. wires with colanders on their heads. Which are attached to rockets on their freaking backs. So apparently the penguin is using some kind of signal to control his penguins. Even you can't fill in the gaps on that Well, one. because there's also yet another frequency that is later jammed. So it's got to be that. I like when he gives his General MacArthur speech to these like 300 plus penguins he says my dear penguins we stand on a threshold and it's okay to be scared many of you won't be coming back but it's time to punish all of god's children male and female where the sexes are equal when their erogenous zones are being blown sky high and all i could think was do these penguins understand english this is more for him at oh. this point the no the, the penguins don't understand this this is just for his benefit because he lives alone a lot you know he talks to himself a lot 
but it's just the life of a bachelor. The penguins all disperse. They jump in the water. They make their way to the city streets. Batman's riding around the Batmobile. He sees all these penguins with freaking rockets strapped to their back. You just can't help but smile looking at them. The penguin is watching all of this from some sort of closed circuit TV that broadcasts all of the behaviors of Gotham City back to his lair in the zoo. And it occurred to me that the finale of this movie, Bo, is really Batman going toe-to-toe with about 300 penguins with freaking rockets strapped to their backs. Yeah. It's ridiculous. It's nonsense. But Batman gets in his bat boat, drives through the sewers, and- Oh, is that what he says? He's in his boat? Yeah. Who knows anymore? The lady with the dog is doing the emceeing of this operation where every now and again she'll just robotically announce, like, the penguins are almost in position. The white zone is for immediate loading and unloading. Do not touch the nozzle. There's a, a bit where Batman has to spin his boat around to avoid some penguin rockets, but that's no big deal. And then the dog lady says, 30 seconds to ignition. Estimated casualties, 100,000 people. And then it's 15 seconds to ignition. Wait, so- I thought they were going to drown babies now they're gonna blow up the city plan a was drowning all the babies that got oh, sidetracked okay. I gotcha. by the note good for him having a backup yeah you know plan b's are important especially pregnancies you know what i'm saying <laughs> and then <laughs> out, with only 15 seconds left to go alfred jams the signal that is sending these penguins into the streets and sends them back from whence they came to the sewer zoo all this time christopher walken who's in this oversized bird cage he's trying to convince the monkey to give him the key that would allow him to set himself free just like the dog and pirates yes yes and then clown flunkies have decided that penguin is no longer a good bet so they just abandon him also which makes it batman v penguin which ain't a fair fight at all no and so penguin hops in his rubber ducky and then goes Uh, up some stairs it's got four-wheel drive yeah he can off-road it in the zoo yeah he's good with his hands and batman then angles the bat boat so that he flies through the bottom of the sewer or top of the sewer depending on which side of the sewer you're on i suppose and then crashes into the rubber ducky which then overturns it and it's a batman v penguin hand-to-hand fight which doesn't go very well for penguin but batman also has this remote in his hand and penguin is like ah give me that remote control and he ends up knocking it out of batman's hand and then hits the button which sends all the rockets on the penguin's backs into the air but because alfred has jammed the frequency question mark the rockets are now destined for the sewer zoo of gotham okay i if you say so yeah so bats are also swirling around penguin he goes tumbling back into the sewer as shit is blowing up everywhere walken does get the key from the monkey he hops out of the cage but then somehow catwoman's there with her whip where'd she come from she knocks walken into the water and walken swims down and grabs the gun that was left by fat clown number one or maybe the penguin threw it in the water who knows so he comes out of the water and he has a gun in his hand and he says look selena cat woman whatever your name is i can get you whatever you want money jewels you want a standalone film in this franchise i can make that happen but probably with a different actress i mean come on maybe a different director hopefully a different writer i like when he says look i don't know what you want but i can probably get it with a minimum of fuss (laughs) and she says i want blood and while they're scrapping batman zip lines down into the sewer zoo and he's tells Catwoman like look we should take Christopher Walken to the police and then you and I can go home together you and me we're the same we're samesies I got a king size bed back at my mansion it's not California king but it'll it'll do big bed and then Michelle Pfeiffer says the smartest thing that anyone says in this movie which is like Bruce you and I both know that's bullshit the rules do not apply to people like him who are super wealthy which is 100 (laughs) percent true right and then batman is like no no like i said we're same he's here but i'm super wealthy he rips off his mask which is made of black fondant by the way yeah well that's why he can't turn his head peels away like wet charmin hey pia mache he could have just shaken his head left or right like a wet dog and the thing would have fallen off and michelle pfeiffer says look i would love to come live with you in your castle like a fairy tale and then she scratches his face and and pushes him back and says but i just couldn't live with myself i love it when 
Walken chimes in here and goes, wait, Catwoman, you're Selena Kyle and Bruce Wayne. What are you doing dressed up like Batman? She says, he is Batman, you idiot. <laughs> what are you talking about? Remember earlier in the movie, he said he saw Batman save you. How could he be Batman if he saw Batman save your life? The logic doesn't make sense. It's like being in a Tim Burton movie. I wish I had Chip here. He's always the smart one. Ah, forgot to tell Chip to stop hopping on that one leg. Poor boy's probably up there. Tired, legs sore. Chippy! I'm coming for you, buddy. I don't want you to die like some kind of human pogo stick. So, uh, <laughs> Walken, by the way, got the gun from Fat Clown Number 1, shoots Batman. Not in the face. I shot him right in the symbol on his chest. Bounced off. Who knew? Thought that was the bullseye. Seems like you would design your costume to where your most vulnerable point of entry would be the logo on your chest. The thing that draws the eye most. Yeah. <laughs> Catwoman, meanwhile, says, look, I've got three lives down. Do you have enough bullets for the rest of my lives? And he's like, I don't know. We'll give it a shot. Kapow, 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 kapow. Click, 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 click. So he shot her a bunch of times, but he's now out of bullets. And she says, I've got two lives left. How about a kiss, anti claws Did she really call him anti claws Yeah. Oh, I missed that. I'm so happy. Then she puts the taser that she stole from the clown between them. Which should have been used at another point in this movie other than the balls and taint shocking an hour and a half ago. I mean, I don't disagree with that. But here we are. And so as she kisses him, they're both electrocuted. But she also grabs another cable to really conduct electricity because someone on the set was like, wait, she's kissing him with a taser in their mouth and that kills him? That's not enough power. Yeah. You got to jack this thing up. Also, if you went to get some raisinettes in the movie early on and you missed the part where she gets the taser, this is just out of nowhere. There's a lot of stuff that's real one-off and kind of under the breath that is in girl to the plot why wouldn't she push him off of a high structure or out a window give payback that's the same like electricity isn't even her thing you're right. right no complaints here you're 100 percent right as the world explodes around them batman just mm -hmm. covers his face with his cape like a big dope and then after all the chaos uh settles down he rushes over to the wreckage to try to find catwoman 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 where are you we gotta get to my place are we still gonna do it later that bed's not gonna have people on top of it having sex by itself and while he's uncovering this wreckage penguin emerges from the water on the other side of the room as batman is rifling through this wreckage yep and as batman pulls back one like sheet of corrugated metal uh-huh he finds the now charred remains of Christopher Walken. Tell him Large Marge sent you. It looks like Large Marge was electrocuted with the bug eyes and the hair blown back and everything. It's very good. <laughs> And Penguin, meanwhile, is staggering closer and closer. He grabs an umbrella, but it's one that's like just a children's mobile instead of a weapon. Right. And then he says, hang on, I'll be with you in just a second. It's getting a little hot in here. I need a drink of ice water. And to take off all my clothes. Yeah, and after announcing he needs a drink of water, he just collapses dead. And then a bunch of little people dressed up like penguins yes emerge from the back of the sewer zoo to basically serve as pallbearers and lead him into the water where we see him sink into the gross poop water or as the circus squatters call it the bath <laughs> right and and so that's the end of our big finale and we get kind of a ps on the movie where michael keaton and alfred are cruising around the snowy streets of gotham in this polar express nightmare where it's still almost christmas and all the streets are covered in white foam pretending to be snow yeah and so michael keaton sees the shadow of catwoman in an alley and runs like stop the car alfred um <laughs> pause my dvr of tucker i'll be right back and he runs into the alley to look for catwoman but instead he just finds a black cat and brings it back to the car with him and alfred's like oh boy i'm gonna end up taking care of this i'm gonna be taking care of this cat until i die or it dies at my hands one of the two <laughs> and alfred then says merry christmas master Wayne and he says yeah Merry Christmas Alfred and goodwill to men and women I mean while we're at it and I guess uh people who are non-binary 
the asexuals of the world. Uh, also cats, dogs, and penguins. Some of those were pretty cute. And goodwill to everything, I guess. Microbial life. All of it. And then we get the tacked on shot in addition two weeks before the movie came out where we the camera rises high over the rooftops of Gotham where the bat signal uh, shines and a silhouette of a woman who is not Michelle Pfeiffer <laughs> rises up to, so that we see that Catwoman is in fact still alive because uh, how dare you make a movie where somebody actually dies. The end. The end. Ba, 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 ba man the danny elfman score in this is real good i mean say what you will about this movie but the music is quite good yeah that's something else about that first one that the interjection of those print songs was a little uneven yeah it's super distracting for sure you don't have that in here. you do get rick james super freak but you're at a costume party and people are clearly gonna go fuck on the california king bed over in housewares and and plus so much of the movie is about like oh these people are psychologically damaged aka freaks we didn't get a shot of the penguin shaking his ass to rick james yeah thank god Eh, you know two schools of thought there that is batman returns i don't know what it was, after watching this two times in a row recently did you find anything to enjoy about it i think that the performances in this movie are really good christopher walken is as entertaining as always i was really impressed by how good michelle pfeiffer is in this and i was also surprised by how many iconic lines came from this movie like little scenes like the scene where she says meow and the building blows up behind her and again maybe that's impressed in in my memory having seen the trailer or just because i was clearly inebriated watching this in the theater but i think that all of the actors in this are giving it a hundred percent i just really have a hang up on the construction of the story it makes it less enjoyable for me yeah i don't disagree with any of that i think i enjoy this movie more than i did when i first saw it but that's because the performances are so good and because a lot of the stuff that's happening under the surface of the movie is really interesting but yeah the story is nonsensical and obtuse and it doesn't do enough to explain itself like a few lines here or there would go a long way to making this feel a little more narratively satisfying but yeah. i do like all the scenes with michelle pfeiffer and michael keaton are fantastic and and danny devito is clearly having a ball with this so it just shows what happens when you put a group of really talented actors in a movie with a competent script but for our next episode have i got a movie for you Bo, where a group of talented actors are uh, put in a film with a thoroughly incompetent script that will make batman returns look like citizen kane oh wow i have a question for you yes please you're a fan of it's a wonderful life one of my true? favorite movies of all time yeah and i also know that you're a big fan of bigfoot I am a big fan of Bigfoot. I like that as well. Bo, what if I could perform a Christmas miracle and combine two of the things that you love in life in one completely unexplainable movie? <laughs> that sounds amazing. We are talking about 2017's Pottersville, a movie that features a roster of legitimate actors and actresses in a movie that will completely question how movies get made i can't wait for this michael shannon judy greer ron perlman christina Hendricks, ian mcshane thomas lennon are all in this movie and it is truly one of the worst things that's ever been captured on film huh well i've never seen this still haven't but i feel as a bit of a and it's a wonderful life expert this is a movie made for me just do me a favor don't take out your aggression on your monitor like batman does take it out on your cat like batman does <laughs> good advice for us all <laughs> bo do you have any final thoughts on batman returns the second ish movie in the canon of batman movies chip stop hopping on one leg already whatever you say dad why are you talking like that you sound like a fool come back and see us in two weeks time like rate review send us an email pick six movies at gmail.com we're kind of on social media running around but we got lives and shit to do so we can't always be everywhere all the time this was a strangely satisfying watch and it, it'll be nice to get back to movies that make me wonder why we do this show oh that's happening it is a christmas miracle <laughs> We'll see you in two weeks, everyone.